So um, let's um, uh, start the meeting at uh, 6.04. And welcome, everyone. Thanks for coming out on this uh, rainy evening. Um, and just so we have a, a sense in, in terms of names, could we all identify ourselves, um, starting with John Julio in the back um, of, the, of the room? John? Just didn't you say my name? I did, but you know, that's not the same as hearing it from John Julio. <laughs> Caitlin Morgan, kindergarten mm -hmm. teacher. Mm -hmm. Maggie McGlynn, speech and language pathologist. Welcome. Deanna Murray, pre-K teacher. Welcome. Joanne Mankoff, community member. And Tammy Willie. Okay. Lexi Murray, parent. Ursula <coughs> Stanley, parent. Joanne Bernstein, her educator. Liz Gilfoyle, parent. Okay. Great. Welcome. Um, we still have one at the back. Oh, okay. Sixth grade. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, first up, we have um, any uh, agenda revisions? Is there any uh, proposal to move items on the agenda um, so that we can, if folks don't want to stay for the entire meeting, we can just address certain things from, um, we the first? Playground, playground. Yes. Playground. Okay. Um, any others that um, we can possibly move? Does anybody have an objection to moving the playground to the forefront um, in terms of a uh, discussion item? Jim, we have two as well as this. Okay. So, we move um, 3.3 to 3.1, put 3.3 up, and then 3.5 up as well. Any objections? No. Okay. okay. Um, any public comments or correspondence? Um, well, I was going to say, since she's dealing with topics, um, I was going to propose that we address okay. the sections of the letter yeah. that address the topics. And then we can add the letter as a whole into, into the record. Um, Chip Heather also uh, dropped a letter um, um, dated June 3 off because um, he thought this was the last uh, Rumley board meeting. Uh, which um, it actually, I don't know if it will be. No, well, it's not the last meeting, but maybe the last uh, meeting in the in the building. Maybe in the building, but it's not um, the last meeting. You know, maybe, but maybe not. Um, but he dropped off the letter that uh, I'll read into the, the record. Um, I can read it now if folks would like. Or I can, yeah. So, so it's uh, to the Romney School Board. Over the years, working at this School has been a privilege and challenge that demanded true personal and professional growth. The key key contributor to both of these kinds of growth has been the working relationships uh, with the Romney School Board. That organization, like the staff, like the students and their families, um, has not been a static body. Individuals have come and gone. But as an institution, the board has come to have a unique character that only might be possible with, with a school like Romney and a community like Middlesex. Even though I am not a Middlesex resident, and even though there has been times of great turmoil in the life of the school and the town, I do not regret in the least having the opportunity to participate in the collective enterprise. Uh, but I am profoundly moved by the impact of the changes in governance that are now being enacted because they mean that this con continually evolving body that has been so integral to the lives of everyone connected to the school will no longer exist as a self-sufficient organ of the school community. To me, th there is a gravity to this change that deserves earnest reflection looking both forward and back in time. I can't be present at tonight's meeting, but I did want to let folks know that quite apart from the business you will be conducting, the Romney School Board as a collaborative body will be in my thoughts. So I'm Chip Heather. So I'm gonna make this, um, make this be part of the record. Um, any other comments and correspondence? Um, and, and Chip makes a good point that we are uh, potentially coming to the end of an era um, in regard to local school board, um, local school boards in the Washington Century Supervisory Union. Um, as of July 1st, uh, unless something happens, uh, this board will dissolve, be dissolved by law. Uh, actually, December 31st. Oh, December 31st. It will still be in existence for auditing purposes. Um, but in terms of a, a decision-making body, we will um, no longer be 
a, uh, a viable organization, uh, which you know, has a sadness about it. Uh, but so we should talk later about uh, celebrating that later in the later in the month as we get closer to um, the the thirtieth of June. Um, so, um, is there a motion for the consent agenda to approve the minutes of our May sixth, uh, two thousand nineteen, May twenty fourth, two thousand nineteen, and May 29th, two thousand nineteen meetings? So moved. Is there a second? Sorry. Uh, any any comments on the uh, May 6, 2019 minutes? Uh, any comment on the May 24, 2019 minutes? No. Any comment on the May 29, 2019 minutes? I'm all in favor of approving the minutes. Say aye. 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 Uh, no, no opposed? Okay. Passes. Thank you. Um, so we will take up the uh, playground um, renovations first. Okay. Um, and I assume that we do not have much. Uh, well, yeah, John I, John I, no, because I need a direction from the board. Okay. So I can't go do work with John without knowing where you want to go as a board. I need the board to make a decision on what type of renovations as we outlined in the last meeting. Okay, so the choices that we have is either to develop a new preschool playground off the back of the school. Off the back of the school. Um, or do a renovation up at the main playground. Yep. And you know, need a ramp up to up to that uh, playground. And you need it now for ADA purposes. Okay, we need we need the ramp regardless. Yeah, we do. And I mean, my recommendation last time, although it was more money, but it was, I think, better money in the long run is to build a ramp and build a playground up there. Mm -hmm. That's ADA accessible. Okay. And we went up and did a, a site view. Okay. Um, do we have any firmer numbers on what the, we anticipate I, I that would be? I can't. I'm not, I need a decision by the board, Chris. I don't have any firmer numbers. I need a decision by the board before we go and get better numbers and start contracting with people to do that design. And what's the last last meeting that we talked about this that we were gonna allow John to come back with what some viable options. That's what I was that's I thought you were gonna do something and then just give us some at least, at least a little I mean we, I know we got some rough estimates. Right. About a hundred thousand dollars. Unless we start unless we start co sign a contract with him as an architect to start doing design. And I wasn't comfortable with that until you as a board say what are the parameters of where we're going. Because there was also talk of moving the entire playground mm -hmm. right. and doing, you know it, where doing it a different way. Well, I think we were so. looking for, at least from my perspective, we were looking for guidance on what the different options were, what the costs might be for and relocating it versus. And as I said, you, he won't give us a. He does his liability insurance will not allow him to design playgrounds. He doesn't do that. Right. So he's not going. He he can design a ramp, and the ramp. Is you know what he said that he was comfortable doing without doing the contract is the numbers I gave you last time between thirty and forty thousand dollars probably mm -hmm. to get a ramp up there. I I think to be uh, direct, I thought that our question was should the playground be in what we would call the wet field? Like should we mm -hmm. move the playground to the wet field or build a much longer ramp up to the current playground? With the question being. Is it actually like more accessible because there's less of a ramp to gain access to the to the wet field than to build a much longer ramp to access where the current playground was? That's sort of where I thought. Yeah. And then there was the third option of which I thought that we were uh, not as interested in, which was having just a pre-K playground off of the third and fourth grade I mean, classrooms. Yeah. So that's what I thought. Is right. that what we're, is that what we're, that's what, that's what I thought we were discussing was. Yeah, and that I questions. had asked to maybe get, I had asked if, if we had someone to come in to us, what we were just talking about, assess kind of the difference between an accessible and an inclusive playground, just looking at the minutes, but maybe John coming in to, to help us, like Brian said, kind of establish where the best place would be to even start to have I should a more firm conversation. Okay. No, that's it. So, so when I think about this, 
um, I guess the sum total is we are obligated to be ADA compliant. And I see no situation where we are not going to, in some way, want to take advantage of the space that we have on that hill. So I don't really see any way that we get around building ramps. So let's say that we you know, move the playground. Well, that space is going to be appropriated for something else, and then it wouldn't be ADA compliant in that regard. You can't have a soccer game there, because we can't get to the soccer game or whatever. So I see no way around that ramp. So I guess from my perspective, the simplest and most straightforward thing to do is to get a ramp to that area now, just bear the cost of it and be done with it. And um, I mean, I guess I would be in favor of keeping the playgrounds where they are because I like that it's a little secluded behind the school and it feels a little somehow more protected. But, but anyway, I guess that's the first part of it. Do we want a ramp or do we not want a ramp? Do we want, and, and to me, I feel like we should just get it done with. And you had mentioned a lift too, looking into the. But I guess we can't really look into any of the like how. Let me rephrase, instead of ramp, create access to that playground, mm -hmm. I agree. And um, yes, and I don't think we can really evaluate what's the best kind of ramp, what's the best kind of lift, what's the best kind of whatever until we've decided to, at least that's my understanding of what Bill's saying. Yeah, I'm trying, I need to know where you're, mm -hmm. where you're going. Right? Con architects like to have, you know, they like to have a contract before you start working with them. Right. You know, if they're, and, they're, to, go ahead, sorry. and to be clear, John is already you know, met with our special ed director, our pre-K teacher, myself, and our custodial staff to do a preliminary scan of the available spaces. And it's really up to you. Was he, was not, he was not going to weigh in really on which one was best. And was it three different spaces, the ones that we toured, which was out the back? Yep, the soccer. And then the bigger field, and then up top, where right. the playground is now. Mm -hmm. The, I mean, each area has issues, you yeah. know? I mean, just keeping it plowed and shoveled and all of that with that long of a span is, is a challenge. Um, in addition, you know, us paving at the back, you know, we met with even, you know, someone that does that type of work. And he said, you know, he wouldn't guarantee it more than a year. So, what, you know, the paving? Yeah. the paving, because of the heavy equipment that goes over it back there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're the other we get day. deliveries, we get um, fuel service, we get plowing from the town, um, all down that service road and in the back for a turnaround. Okay. So I, I feel like we have scanned, we just need a decision. So if, if um, the, that backfield soccer area, uh, not the recreation, but back the wet field, I guess sometimes. Yeah. The little know. soccer field is if, 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 if that was ever to be used for um, activities, uh, that would have to be uh, ramp access as well? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yes, because I think, I think, I don't, I haven't surveyed it, so I do not know the, the elevation gain from the back door or from mm -hmm. this door to that place, to mm -hmm. that place. That's why we need to, that's why we need an engineer, an architect, because there are, it's a one in 12 slope, as I said, that you have to have to be ADA accessible with breaks every 30 feet for five foot of level. And the surface material is what we have been checking into. Yeah, we're trying because to see. Because right now it's, you know, pretty rough. Yeah, can we go with something like a stay mat versus uh, uh, an asphalt? But either way, to ensure the asphalt stays for longer, it gets into heavier costs because of the drainage. You know, we all live in Vermont, we all know what frost does around here. Yeah. So, you know, that those are the things and that's why we need, I can't give you anything more than the back of the envelope costs because we need a design that's to be done. Mm -hmm. And we need to sign a contract for with an architect, architect to do that. The architect being Black River Design. That's who I would suggest. Who but didn't you just say that they don't specialize in playgrounds? They would do the playground piece. We'd have to go specifically to a playground company like Amy did with the company that's that put in the playground last year. They, you have to go straight to playground companies to do playground design. They would design the ramp. Right. Right. No, no, they wouldn't design the ramp. They would design the playground. No, but Black River Design. Black River Design would do the ramp and any, any site work that has to be done around. Okay, so is... Um, the ramp would be phase one. Could be. Access would be phase one, right? Okay. 
So the way that I see it, we have to decide whether or not we want to consider alternate locations or whether or not we want to keep it there. And we have pretty limited information because we don't have dollar amounts on what everything would cost. Do we feel like we can, like, like what do you think? What do you think, Ryan? I'd like to know what, I'd sort of like to have some guidance from the experts on what's going to make the most sense for accessibility for kids. Um, and, you know, if, so I feel, I, I feel a little uncomfortable being put in a position of making the recommendation when I don't really feel like I have the... I'm not asking you to make a recommendation. I'm asking you to commit to a location. Right. But, but I that think, is I think, part of the recommendation. I think, yeah, I think what I'm... But there's, there's only one... I, I only think one. there's only one location that it can be unless you're going to move the playground and everything else. And, and it's... And, not do it in phases because you know kids grow up and, and it's and, and the playground also has an, already has an accessibility issue so I think at the very least we have to make that playground unless we're going to move the playground um, and that just doesn't, to me it doesn't sound like that's a feasible option. I asked of, John about a lift potential and as I recall Diana you were there I don't think that he knew of one no, yeah, um, I, he didn't seem to have that knowledge for that. But Brian, I think we're on the same page. I'm thinking like we are still wondering which is the right site in terms of like what is, because when I think about it, it's a it's more long-term problem uh, problem in terms of like there is, it will cost more to go up to the upper access, but there's a lot a larger maintenance cost and the question of what is the time frame of actually accessing that playground and how much does that so cut into yeah I think that's one way of looking at it the other way is that you don't have ADA access now to your playground mm -hmm. and and so not all individuals can use that but if we moved the entire playground to where it's lower and you have a shorter ramp and then it then the whole playground is also accessible and the ramp is less which means it takes children less time to get to the playground and then the long-term maintenance of uh, plowing the ramp is lower of cost because you don't have such a long you know, number of yards that you're, that you're plowing. So are you thinking that we would then give up use of that space? That space would become non-accessible to anybody? I don't have a plan for that place, but it could, I mean, if you moved the whole playground down, that seems like it is an, is an option, and I think what Brian was wondering is a recommendation from somebody who has had some insight to say, yeah, that's a better long-term vision, or no, the better plan is to just build the long ramp. And I think we want some input on the right. Because we have, the, even the ramp is, was switchback versus... And that's where you're going to need a design. The, the, the estimate of, we can estimate about the cost between thirty and $40,000. You're not. I mean, if if that's where you're gonna, if that's where you want to go, and then you want to say, well, what does the design look? Is it switchback? Is it straight? You're gonna. And you can work with an architect to get a couple different versions of the design. It's like when you did the building project here. You started talking about well, what were some of the things that you wanted to have before you even got into the building project. Then you and you signed a contract. You went with two different architecture firms, but to then get some concepts of what you want for a design and make some decisions. But you were already in the place of saying, we know we're going to go and we're willing to put money down for an architect to do a conceptual design. On a whole building renovation, architects are willing to take more lead, not knowing because they know there's a bond boat coming. This isn't a bond boat type of piece. It's, you know, this is work within a capital fund. So when they see, you know, a project that's a multi-million dollar project, they're willing to be a little bit more upfront with their services. Because they see they get they're going to they get, they're going to get paid they're going to get ten percent of the yeah. project cost. So where that's that ten percent is not not going to cover the design for four four thousand dollars on a forty thousand dollar ramp is not going to cover it. So would John um, be able to provide guidance on what the best location would be, um, or is that the playground design folks that would be able to provide that insight? Um, Even though I know he doesn't design playgrounds. But yeah. in terms of, um, he, he, I'm sure he knows information about accessibility. Would he be able to provide that insight in terms of um, best location for a playground, even though he's not designing it? So I don't know how to answer that, Chris, because I haven't asked him that question. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm here thinking, 
I don't understand why we aren't, why the board doesn't feel comfortable making a decision. That's why I, how I'm perceiving where you are right now. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand that because it's not, I'm not saying that in a, I'm just trying to say I'm being really transparent with you. Mm -hmm. If you want to put the playground, the pre-K playground down here, you're going to have to, in two years, either move in less than two years, because you don't have accessibility to that top. So either you're moving the structures that are up there down. Well, don't we have to recreate a playground, pre-K playground anyways? Mm -hmm. you've, got, you've got some pieces that you, we think you should upgrade. Mm -hmm. Right now, you don't have accessibility. Mm -hmm. And at best, for the pieces that you have there, you have a couple pieces that need some, um, some mm -hmm. to probably renovation to make it more ADA accessible. They are very they're very old pieces, so mm -hmm. I frankly think, and Amy's been lobbying you hard to think about, hey, let's get some more appropriate play pieces. That's anywhere that you're at. The place is, where do you want your playground to be? Your overall playground, pre-K okay. six. And, and that, right, and that becomes the, um, the cost question as to whether um, it is better to have it, you know, the, the entire playground is not going to be off the back of the building. I think, I suspect it has to either be in the small soccer field um, or where it is now. Um, and Right, and you're going to have to, you're, gonna, you're probably going to incur, I mean, you're going to have to move structures that are up there. Yeah. Most likely they're in concrete somewhere in the base, so you've got to then move those down, reset them in new concrete. You know, you know, you're going to do that, or you're going to, you're probably in the end, probably going to have the same cost either way, because you got to move everything that's up there down, and then reset plus it. Plus the drainage. Plus the drainage. That's plus a, for the small new, soccer. For the small instead soccer. of just replenishing but, the mulch or whatever the ground cover is, you're going to have to think about that. But in terms of a, a student access, I mean, I think Kate, I think it was Katie made the good point of saying, depending upon where the access points are, the student could be going up all the way to the playground, get there just in time to turn around again and come back because recess is over. Um, and so, you know, that sounds like that's the upper okay. playground versus the small soccer. So, I mean, that's a factor I don't think we've really explored much. And we, so my question about John is, if we said, yeah, go and contract with him uh, for um, a grant design, uh, but is he able to say, you know, based on his experience in, in designing schools, um, and, and I'm assuming he knows about uh, ADA accessibility. He knows it very well. <laughs> so whether or not, which would be the more accessible of the two locations um, that we, I think, we're really dealing with, which is small soccer field or where the, the playground is now. Because unless, I mean, I'd be glad to hear from others saying that you think we could be off the back end. I don't know if we can be off the back end for the entire playground. Is that is that a feasible design to yeah. be, a, be off the back end? So is it? I don't think we have the land. Right. Okay, so it's really either small soccer field or where we are now. In, in terms of a yeah. playground, right? So would John be able to, you know, if we said hired him, would he be able to give us some guidance for a vote on the seventeenth as to which location it should be? I don't know the answer to that, Chris. And I'm not trying to stall. I just okay. don't know the answer to that. It sounds though that there's some rec recommendation towards going with what we have now and just building a ramp. That's that's my I'm recommendation. Doing. Yeah. Is that, is that because you think, because of the cost, you think it's going to be? Um, I think you're going to. I think you're going to have a hard time providing accessibility to everything that you have here, and I find it hard to believe that even if you move that playground down, that that upper area wouldn't be used. And that's not providing accessibility at all. I mean, inevitably, we'd have to, as uh, yeah. Allison mentioned, at some point. I mean, we would have to make it accessible. I don't disagree with that. Okay. Um, first one. Um, I, I have one suggestion about um, people that might be able to assist in deciding where. Um, I know the pre-K licensing, um, the state licensing may be able to give a little, just not, not probably as well as, as John from Black River, but may be able to give some kind of input on, on what might be a, a better spot for, for pre-K children um, of all needs. 
And then also there's something that John suggested uh, suggested when we were surveying that we did put the playground in the small soccer field, um, an access ramp to get to the larger playground could go up that little hill by the four square um, area, which would save, you know, from looping through all the birch trees. So he said if we had access from the back door to the small soccer field for the pre-K playground and just continued the ramp all the way up, um, it would be a smaller slope as well. I just wanted to note that as well. I'm wondering if though that would be a more expensive option because we need to address the drainage in the soccer field plus the ramp up. Can I read Kelly's because we forgot to read hers? Mm -hmm. Can I read Kelly's statement? Sure. Um, and that's on the playground? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was number two on hers. So Kelly had sent an email and a couple of the discussion. Kelly Bush, our special ed director. Um, playground accessibility. I'm happy to see this as an action agenda for this evening. I urge you to take action to move this work forward so that all children in the Middlesex community may access the playground. As you are aware, the com conversation about the need to create accessibility to the playground has been going on for months now with no action taken. Every day that passes delays this opportunity for all children in the Middlesex community to have equal access and learning opportunities. I feel the need is within my role to advocate for this work to begin as soon as possible. I advocated for this during the April board meeting and I continue to urge you to move this project forward. Projects of this nature take significant amount of time and planning. The pre-K playground has been out of compliance for many years and it's time that's upgraded and accessible for all children. So, and I would just say, I don't think that any, I think that I could probably assume that everyone on the board believes that we want access and we want an accessible playground and we want an appropriate pre-K playground. I believe that fully. I think what, um, what I'm hearing is we want the, the design for access and having a solid design and a well-considered uh, application of a ramp that's going to work well is that's the holdup. It has nothing to do with um, our level of good intentions. So, so if we is that we, the board's intent? Uh, that's I well, I, I, I think it, I don't think there's any question about well, that's, the intent, well, but, well, that's first I've interpreted it that way. So I thank you for saying that, Katie. Hmm. That we would not want to have access. I, Chris, I'm sorry, but I have not heard that directly said before. I haven't said you haven't in, in inferred it. I'm saying I haven't directly heard that before. I have a couple questions. The first one is when we were looking at the pre-K playground, it became known that we couldn't really fence the entire pre-K area without making the entire pre-K area ADA compliant and accessible the footing, changes to the footing like it can't be grass. So we were talking about fencing in a smaller area. What dimensions are required for the actual school? And if we fence the entire area up there, would we then have to put mats down or footing, change the footing for the entire area? Do you see, do you understand my question? No. What's the? So I was surprised when I was up there last night. I was, I guess we were talking to Kelly maybe. And we were talking about the pre-K playground. and. I tried to ask as many ways as I could to make sure I got it right, but my understanding was is that we actually had to either reduce the size of the fencing or we needed to make the footing accessible for the entire area. So we couldn't just like make the footing and the area accessible, like I think it was 18 by 18 or 36 by 36. 75 square feet yeah. per, per child. Per child. Is that so, what so, so we couldn't, you know, let's say that we needed a 100 square foot area because it's easy. We couldn't. We couldn't just make 100 square feet accessible and have the rest still fenced. We would have to make the entire thing accessible or limit the entire kindergarten to the 100 square foot area. So I believe that that is correct. If well, it's, it's not. It's not 100 square foot area. I, it's I'm 75 saying to make it easy. Yeah. Right. Okay. And then the second question is: Is how so much space say, do we just need? Just for clarification, when you're saying footing, do you mean matting? I think so like yeah, they some can't type of matting on grass. So that's what you mean by footing. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Thank you. No, no. It's not a horse arena. I guess. No, no, no. Yeah. Just so, um, and then the, how much space do, are we required to have for the the other playground? So would we be needing to make that other playground smaller as well? Like, is it so, is the area such that it actually would all fit down here? Do you see what I'm getting at? Am I making any sense? So the, there's... The size guidance, Diana, correct me if I'm wrong, is tied to our pre-K licensure. 
I think oh, she's asking um, about the, the, when you get to the, the big kid then playground. There is no. There's no. I understand that there, that's where the limitation is coming from. Right. Yeah. Seventy-five square feet per oh, child. Like our playground is huge. Let me set a little context here. The Agency of Human Services regulations for pre-K are much, much more stringent than the, anything on around the edu Agency of Education. Mm -hmm. So we're in the world of Agency of Human Services regulations mm -hmm. right now. For the pre-K. For the pre-K. Yes. And they govern pre-K as equally as the Agency of Education, and Deanna knows as well, and so does Joanne, because you guys live in this world, <laughs> is that it makes it really hard for when we come to regulation issues. In terms of access to the playground as a whole, yeah. beyond pre-K, um, is there a requirement that there be matting? I don't know the answer to that, Chris. Okay, that? No. No, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think there is, but I just, no. I, we've had other guys. students who've had accessibility okay. issues and would be fine on grass. We have different requirements for AHA, for the pre-K. Pre pre uh, okay. So, uh, Bill, before I heard you say, you know, I think you're going to have a hard time getting accessibility to everything. And um, I, my first reaction on hearing that was just that that's kind of orthogonal as to whether it's the right thing to do, right? Like, and um, what we're talking about now, even as you mentioned how hard it is, you know, of satisfying these requirements and going future, what those might be, it seems to me that's why now we need a comprehensive plan rather than this incrementalism that just says, well, we're going to take care of the pre-K area, and two years ago we're going to be facing a new problem about how to now we address that. I'm actually saying the, saying the opposite, said David. Okay, well, <laughs> that's why I'm saying, Bill, my recommendation of going for a ramp all the way up is taking you for the long term, where if we were to bring a pre-K down and not able to move the playground from the right. top but down. As Deanna said, of course, there's also, you know, there are different ways of achieving that, right? And so. Yeah, there's different sense. designs, but I, I need to know where we're heading for it because I need, we need, we're gonna have to engage money with Black River Design. Mm -hmm. I would guess that there isn't the space in the small soccer field. I mean, moms, you probably know as well as anybody for both playgrounds. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You know, that's oh, going to yeah, be super clear. Cramped. We have to uh, clear um, more space or have yeah. And I just want to surface, like, who's to say we're not going to have, uh, you know, grades, kindergarten through sixth grade student that needs accessibility mm -hmm. move in this summer? Years. Like, it, it can mm -hmm. happen. So. Which I think was a big part of our conversation the last meeting was making sure we do this the right way and not the fast way. So I understand we're up against compliance that we need to get done, but I, as a board we all feel like we had asked for more input on guidance of, of this space because none of us were comfortable with any of the discussion we had, or at least I wasn't comfortable with the discussion that we had at the last meeting. I feel like we're just moving too fast, contrary to what Kelly feels like. I mean, I wish this conversation happened a long time ago, and maybe it did, and I, I wasn't here on the board. Um, but these are big decisions not to be taken lightly because you're gonna want a playground that is inclusive and accessible for years to come to any type of person. And I'm worried we're under, I'm not, I'm not concerned about the money, I'm worried we're underfunding something that sh that's probably much more money. That's what well, I that's, feel like. As I said last time, if you were gonna do a whole playground in the ramp, you were up around $90,000. And I have looked this up a lot and I've seen much higher oh, yeah. than that you to can be go, inclusive. You can go a lot so higher. So that's the conversation I feel like we need to have is how we, what does this look like and how inclusive do we want to be? I get that we're up against a, a time right now, but this does not feel like we've been dragging our feet at all. I think we've been asking really good questions and I don't feel like we've gotten great answers. So how much money would you commit to finding better expertise <coughs> and who would you like us to use? Does Black River charge by the hour? They do. How much do they charge now? It's one thirty. And did John give an estimate on how long it would take to no, do I didn't, I didn't ask him for that. Um, so if we committed $5,000 to John for design purposes only, uh, that would be, what, 30 hours? I feel like you wouldn't need anywhere nearly that long. But I'm just He's going to need, so here's the thing, because we talked about drainage issues up there. He's going to have to bring in civil engineer consultants. Oh, is he to park it? 
not perk it. It's how do you drain it, and where does the drainage go? Top? I mean, you're going to get into you're going to get into watershed issues. Up on the top? No. Well, the little little soccer, if you want the little soccer field. You're well, gonna, okay, so you're going to get into all that either place because you're going to get into drainage. Remember, we just said that frost is going to be. I think five is going to be low. You might be thinking about ten. If you want design and options. <coughs> okay, so if. Um, so if we committed ten thousand dollars to um, Black River Design, um, I think we'd be asking for an um, analysis of what it would cost to build the ramp, um, and also uh, what it would cost. You know, that's more of a broad-based analysis of where the playground should be. If you're talking about the little soccer field, this is the drainage that we'd have to address in the small soccer field. Hmm. Okay, I'll I will get you. Okay. The ice skating rink? No. Or the ice skating rink potential. Um, can we, um, Chris, I think Ursula had a comment. Hey, absolutely. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, Ursula. So, I mean, I'm hearing the board say that they want more information on little soccer field or building a ramp to the upper, like where the playground is now. And they feel they can't make a decision on the location without more information. And you're telling them they can't have the more detailed information without contracting an engineer. I didn't. I said, well, that's what we're just talking about right now. So, so they that. would have to be willing to spend more to get to designs, or to they would have to look at alternatives for the little soccer field and alternatives for your larger field. So you're looking at two places, so you pay more for design. Don't underestimate how long it's going to take an engineer to do the work. Yeah, I. I um I'm not, this, 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 the conversation has been helpful. I feel like I've gotten a little bit more information um, in the last 10 minutes than we had before in terms of what just makes more sense, um, feasibility and timeliness, because I think um, we do also have to be cognizant of what it's gonna take to ensure that we do have accessibility um, for the next school year. For the building? Uh, for the building. For the building. And so I think we- And the playground, both. We should incorporate that into one, I, I think, because the building can be done now. Right, the building, we can get some of the building pieces right. done this summer, but if they, as I showed you, told you last meeting, they're not they're not big things right. for, to add more accessibility to this building. Well, right. what, what I, I think we also need to look at what's it, what is it going to cost us to resurface yeah. this area, too. I mean, the concrete top side? Yeah, because yeah, that's, that's, that's not accessible, accessible either. That's that's what, does, that does not meet the definition of accessibility out there anymore because of what the frost has done. As I told you last time, the definition now under the ADA code is any variation over a quarter inch. I mean, my, my concern was not wanting to overlook an alternate option that might be the non-obvious option, but perhaps would have been uh, better, but we ignored it because we assumed the playground is here, so that's where we're building the ramp. If people's you know thoughts are shifting, then you know I'm I'm open to that, having heard more of this. I just felt like we have to sort of consider these options so that we don't have this paradigm that this is the only place the playground should be. So, I, I don't know. I, yeah. I guess I've heard from a, a parent side of things and from what I've heard from teachers is that the upper playground often feels congested and that there's not open space for children to play. So I guess when I hear this talk about the lower playground, and I don't know what our numbers as, as a school look like, but whether it's worth considering expanding the playground space or making that lower area more available to kids, like whether that drainage is worth it. And I don't, I'm not out at recess, so I don't have those answers of what it feels like, but I guess if that space is usable and there's ramps coming from both sides. I don't know. It just makes sense as many times as I've tried to walk to that upper playground myself. Like, I can't even walk up and down that ramp in flip-flops, barely. <laughs> so it's interesting to consider how that is going to be accessible for somebody, even as a ramp. And I assume it's going to take a lot of reworking, so, but I could see your concerns over how so long. Point, just a point of like. clarification. The ramp that's up there right now yeah. does not meet ADA at all for slope. Right, which is why it needs to be reworked. It needs a much longer run. Okay. That that is, I don't know. I haven't surveyed it, so I don't want to gather. I don't want to guess a, right. a, a rate of climb on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's much much steeper than any. Okay. Any yeah. ADA accessible ramp. It's clear why it's not working. Yes. Yeah. <laughs>
any other thoughts? Well, I th I, uh, do we want to talk about um, setting a direction, or are people still not? Or, I mean, I, I, I am open to us uh, engaging with Black River Design to you know, estimate out the ramp up there and all the accessibility. Um, access points to the building as well. Does I guess I continue to feel like I really have a hard time seeing how we are going to completely get rid of that area up there. I don't see it happening realistically. And if I don't think that we need to get rid of like area. decide that, that it is a no go zone and the school is never going to use it. I don't see mm -hmm. that happening. Mm -hmm. If that's not happening, we have to have a ramp there. Even if we decided to make the playground different at some other point, which I don't disagree, I think you're totally right, there could be this, you know, another solution that we just have to think outside the box instead of being fixated. Nonetheless, we still need a ramp up to that area. So for me, it feels like the most efficient thing is to get the ramp to the area we have, and then if we want to make additional playground renovations at some other time, I suppose we could talk about it. But I feel like I just don't see any other, I don't see another option, I guess. I feel like that's the most practical and efficient thing to do. So, as part of our um, commitment of, of money um, to Black River, we could ask them to look at that and and come back and say, it, you know, give us some insight as to whether or not that is the most logical place to have the playground. And if it is, then what's give us a, the idea of the ramp there. Um, but have that as part of the overall picture, um, because I think having a, if John's experienced in this, having him look at the entire complex um, is, is probably a better way to do and, and just get information from him on that, uh, along with the ramp. Mm -hmm. uh, because, yeah. you know, it, you know the, the idea is because any time we, we're going to expand access to space, we have to expand <coughs> access to it, right? We yeah, have to expand access total to access. Every, every time we expand use of the space, <coughs> we have to expand the access mm -hmm. to, uh, <coughs> to go to it, right? I think you make a valid point and you do the ramp now, but I wouldn't want to say if we decide to expand the playground. I feel like we need to look at it as a when we decide because there is still that concern of the timing to get up there in, in years to come. So mm -hmm. I don't want, I just, I don't want the ramp up there to say, well, we did it and then it's done. It's I, just not. Because that's not inclusive. And I, I agree with you and I take your point. The pre-K playground, I don't, I'm actually not in favor at all of putting in a bunch of expensive pre-K pre equipment. Um, and I think that we could talk about doing a much more creative playground that maybe doesn't involve so many structures, that maybe involves lots of blocks of wood that don't, can easily be moved. But we could then get accessibility, we could have a playground now, we're gonna have a ramp that we need no matter what. And then it gives us time if we want to have engineers come in. But I mean, we have a kid coming into school that's not going to be able to get up to the playground. So I feel like if, if we make that playground workable now in a way that gets us access to that area and isn't too expensive, I just don't see how we can go wrong. And then we could start now and actually maybe have a hope of getting it done. But I don't think we get to understand. Yeah, it's going to be hard to find a contract. It doesn't yeah, mean we can. I'm not going to say we can, but it's hard. Um, if, do, you, do you have a sense in terms of what engineers cost? Because no, I'm saying, I, I no, do. Okay. So um, if we committed, uh, I think, 15000 divided by 130 is 115 hours of time. I would hope that we do what yeah. you want for your building. And That's 15 15,000, I'm sorry. It's okay, um, thank no, you, Chris. Keep it under 15, I, um, I, I just wanna state that per the uh, preschool childcare licensing that we do have to have many different gross motor structures on our pre-K playground. Um, while like many movable objects are great too that we have, we still need climbing structures and other things that will come at an expense, but will also, um, bump our playground up um, to make our preschool program at Romney a five-star program instead of its current four-star. Mm -hmm. So we're at a four-star program um, when many of the other schools, pre-Ks in the district are at a five-star program because of our playground. Um, so our mm -hmm. playground has been out of compliance for a really long time with our fencing and with our um, accessibility and with not having appropriate structures on our playground for pre-K only. 
So we got we lost points because we were utilizing the older kid playground, which is not pre-K compliant or safe mm -hmm. enough for them. Mm -hmm. So in order to spend the money now to then kind of look and see when community members will decide, do I want to send my child to Rummy for pre-K if they're a four-star program, or am I going to send them to another private school that's a five-star program? I think that bumps it up to community engagement and kind of trying to bring people in because we are under-enrolled right now in, in Rummy pre-K compared to other preschools in the district. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then I guess that I also then have the second question of, so we talk about the accessibility up, so then what about that? the playground what about the structure what about the matting when when does that when do we allocate all of that conversation and money that's up to you if you want to set it aside for work or in i mean i feel like we have enough money in our capital fund to address the ramp and the preschool playground is my understanding from yeah. The general numbers that we had at our last meeting, yeah. which I know aren't fixed, but it was about a, I, I gave you about a ninety thousand. You currently I was just flipping to this so I can look at it. I don't want to say a number of what's in your capital fund without looking at the report. Um, and of course, it's not this one, so I need to do the last one. Is one hundred and sixteen? Okay, as of last meeting. As of the last meeting. Yeah. So I'm in favor of the one. You know, uh, not actually, building. actually, mm -hmm. your end of yes, 116. Much we take out the boiler. Thank you. Mm -hmm. to do that. Once we're, um, building. we're building a ramp to access, then we ought to be accessing a site that is also ADA compliant mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. functional for all preschoolers. So I think that now is the time to invest and design in that so that we can create the right setting for pre K. Is there space within that current small preschool playground to make it? Mm -hmm. So there is room to put yeah. an appropriate structure yeah. within that, that space. That current space is bigger than what's required by code. Mm -hmm. Actually, we went up there and taped it off. The, the, the last meeting we walked around. Yeah. Okay. So there's plenty, plenty of space there's within plenty of that space. area yeah. to make it compliant yeah. and put appropriate structure yeah. within it. So can I just get clear on what the board is asking from Black River Design? So what we're looking for is a comprehensive. I mean, is what I, mean, I was hearing. From what I'm hearing, they can't. They are not the ones to do a comprehensive. Not of the playground analysis. itself. Of the the ADA and the ramp. Yes, the mm -hmm. playground. We go to. We go to. We do what we did with the last playground. We say what are the type of structures we want. And we ask for bids to come back in. Okay. So. Um, so. But I heard at some point a, a full site analysis. I think that was describing the work that needs to happen, like to make the uh, access to the building smooth. <coughs> And uh, this oh, what I was looking at all available spaces. Well, there's some discussion about having them analyze where would the best site be for the playground. If that can, if that's within their area of expertise, um, and in which conjunction, playground? All what? of them? What? All of the playgrounds, or just the pre-K? Um, I think, I think all of them actually, because it's a, a, an access issue for all of them. Ultimately. So just so I was, because the way I kind of heard you saying it before too, like you had mentioned, um, you know, that it has to be the drainage work study, then like that would be a comprehensive thing. But what you're looking for, I'm hearing in this analysis is, okay, short of doing the full amount of work up, give kind of a rough idea of where would be. What would be the better right. spot? Right. And then worry about the details. So you guys want a cost estimate and, of like, if we were to put it on the soccer field, if we were going to do something up here? I think that would be part of the part of the workup. It's just yeah. basically basically get um, a if option A would be this and this is why we think it's a good idea. Option B would be this and this is why we think it's a good idea and this is what each A and B would cost and commit an amount of money toward getting that information. So they'll have, getting those estimates. So they'll have to do uh, surveying and all. Yeah. Yeah. How how much would that run us to to do that type of comprehensive analysis. Um, the more you pay, the more comprehensive. <laughs> I, I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. It's the way it is. And I don't I didn't ask John for a quote to do all that work. Because in the initial cost estimates that you provided us was 
this was hit, was any not of this built into it? Not the way you're talking right now. But was any of it built no, into it? No, what was built in was he thought that he could do a design for a ramp to get up there for the 30 to 40 that mm -hmm. I had in there. The design or the ramp construction? The ramp, the, not, and the construction. You know, right. We get it done. Let's get this project done from the beginning to end. So if we, I'm just thinking, if we're so you're asking for a lot more right now, you've at least how you laid it out of fifteen thousand. That's fifteen thousand on top of upwards of potentially a hundred thousand. Well, or, or, I mean, right? I, I, would, I would say yes. We're using fifteen thousand to get the information that would then give us the option of, of which design to go with. Um, if we're committed to a design of, of just going up on the where the playground is not now, then we can make a commitment to that. I, I want for us to take that into consideration because I know when they originally gave the estimates, Bill did, he talked about accessibility, you know, access points out of the rooms, but not necessarily. I was talking about this whole this front. Front. Right now, Bill did, so. I can. What we're going to deal with here yeah. is drainage and, and, and run a water runoff. We have a watershed issue here. So, we, and this is that, that I don't know so what type. We're not of, dealing with that. Right. I don't know what type of things you're going to run into there. Right. It is an accessibility issue. It may be, but we have lots of accessibility issues, and we're taking them one at a time. And I'm sure we're not talking about, um, you know, because the drainage you'd have to dig up the concrete, right, mm -hmm. and do construction work underneath to create a better drainage pattern, and then water we concrete the whole the thing. What water run runoff treatment? Whatever. What, okay, so we're, we're not talking, talking about that right now. That's what we you had a well, we should, I think we should be because if we're talking about accessibility for yeah. a building and. The, the way you get into our building isn't accessible. Then, I mean, what? What do we do? I, I, I don't, that should be like priority number one. <coughs> okay, then we should not be talking about the uh, playground. Well, I think we need to talk about we have enough money for all of it. Well, I think I know I raised the the question about looking at the options, and I raised that because I wondered if you know there was going to be some answer that said. Oh, this would be great, and it would solve a lot of problems. But I think after hearing all of this, then the wet playground is potentially now too complicated as a, an option, and it might not be a good use of our money to spend fifteen thousand dollars to answer that question. Mm -hmm. I was sort of wondering if the answer was going to come from the group or from the audience. Um, but it seems like we might be, in terms of having limited resources financially, maybe the best choice is to take. The access to the current playground, and then that fifteen thousand dollars could be some of what we could use to deal with our um, pavement access to the doors of the building. So that's my rethinking, and I just am willing to change my mind easily. So. <laughs> a quick question: Does anybody in the audience have any thoughts they would be willing to share as to whether or not the present playground that we have up there? Does that function at all for somebody who needs wheelchair access, or once you have a wheelchair up in that area, can you just not really move from point A to point B? Um, yeah. The grass area is okay. The stone underneath the slide structures and the swings, not accessible at all. Wood chips, iffy. <laughs> not so much. But the grass is okay? Yeah. As long as it's even. It's okay. The pre-K area tends to be really quite flooded in a large area in the entrance way, like right in front of the shed, mm -hmm. like underwater pretty significantly for most mm -hmm. of the spring, mm -hmm. part of the fall. So that's where the pre-K playground is now? Yeah. Yep. Um, and also the, um, every play item on the preschool playground is not handicap accessible. We have a um, we have that wooden house that is not big enough for a wheelchair. The sandbox has no wheelchair accessibility. Um, we don't have a, a handicap accessible swing and we have a balance beam. So that those are the things that are on our pre-K pre playground right now. And I think the last time I asked this and I can't remember the Exact answer, but I had asked if we could do things in phases. Like, could we make it accessible with the swing now and kind of do this in phases? And there was a reason that we couldn't, but I can't remember. I think Amy spoke. We have to have the. Why. We have would have to upgrade the fence. 
like if, once you start making changes, the fence, my understanding, is no longer grandfathered. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. For, yeah. Pre, pre, for the pre-K. So then you've lost your playground for the pre-K. Until it's... You gotta go. So, right. Once you, it's kind of like once you start st touching it, you gotta... Are mm -hmm. we... Don't we have, okay. the, the fence that we have is not compliant. So per the new licensing regs from a couple years ago or so is that once any construction begins, you have to then be in compliance with the, the new and current regulations. So our fence that we have has been grandfathered in but is not up to, to par. So if we start doing any kind of construction, then licensing could come and say we can't operate preschool here because you didn't fix the fence when you did X, Y, and Z. I, I apologize for my ignorance because I think you all already know this, but I, what's the deal with the fence? How is a fence compliant or not? You have to have a fence of at least four feet of the dam, or yep. five, I can't remember which one. Height is that? A height. height, and it has to have less than two and a half inches, I believe, between the bars, mm -hmm. all around the playground. Our, our fence can be climbed by kids and they, and they can get out. <laughs> um, so that's, that's posed a, a great safety risk in the past. Okay. <laughs> so we have to kind of go all in. Mm -hmm. When you start doing construction, mm -hmm. yeah. you can't, you know, no longer. <coughs> but you're just, we're just talking about the preschool. Right. Yeah. Right, right. To my understanding, there's absolutely no regulations on anything else that we provide for the older kids. ADA, or, ADA, well, yeah, compliance. ADA compliance, yes. but as far as like Department of Ed, they Department of Ed does not have as long as it. Their actually, our insurance is more yeah. stringent okay. than the Department of Education. <laughs> <laughs> when it comes to playgrounds, it's just the truth. If, yeah. Yeah. if we were in Massachusetts, it'd be a whole other ball game. The Department of Ed in Massachusetts is much more stringent than insurance companies, but mm -hmm. our insurance company is the one that makes it actually certifies our playgrounds. So it sounds okay. I'm just can we have it? Um, just basic assessment on the um, prioritization on accessibility issues. So that we're at least saying what the most important issue in terms of accessibility is and working down the list. Yeah, I think John, John can do that for your overall. If, if you were if, I'm assuming you're asking that in terms of an overall accessibility for yeah. the building and site. So yeah. John can do that. Okay. Um, but in terms of what we're doing now, is there a sense as, I'm assuming access to the building for wheelchair, in terms of getting in and out, is a priority for this upcoming year? Yes. Yeah. For all. So some, can we just say for all instead of for mm -hmm. wheelchair? Yeah, for all. Okay. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry. No. Um, but, so that would be certainly a priority. Yeah. Right? Access to the current playground uh, would be a priority. Um, the access to now see the access to the building is can be a multifactorial mm -hmm. issue. Um, is there an access issue from the parking lot to the sidewalk um, into the building? It's the type of material and what happens to that material. Usually, stay mat to a um, handicap accessible. <coughs> Parking space is usually what's done at a minimum. So you know, the, you know the gray material is like crushed up slate and yeah, it's real yeah. hard. That's usually a minimum where the best is asphalt with drainage and all that. So you're not gonna. I don't see. We in our other schools for these issues, we use stay mat as a solution okay. instead is, of going to we, asphalt. Do we have an access like that from? And what I mean by that is getting from the parking lot onto the sidewalk. Thing. Right. We have a ramp on our current sidewalk right now. And is that, is that Actually, work? I mean, I think what the improvement that could be sought is actually um, to make the ramp accessible from where the handicapped parking yeah. place right. is. That's, yeah. what yeah. Just, which is not, that's what I was just talking about with the stay mat and okay. all that. And, and then, because of that. Like the parking place is here and the access is way over there. Mm -hmm. So moving the handicapped parking space. Well, if we well, watch well, you have to move it right across the school. You make a you make a cut to the curb a curb cut. Oh, okay. needs to be a new yeah, put on the curb right. anyway. Oh, so at, at the end, end of the yeah. sidewalk versus. Right. right. Okay. And then the third item is the which John can't do, but you we have a recommendation, right? Is the pre-K playground structure. Structures and yeah, structure or structures. <coughs> okay. And fencing. If we have to have this for the next meeting. Then I think that needs to be part of it. Well, we have an estimate. I mean, 
I think is going to run 20 grand, um, likely to do the pre-K playground with the state map defense and the some beginning planning around some better equipment for kids. Um, that's going to be a minimum of 20 grand. And I give. And that's and is that for a structure that just can be accessible? But I mean, I'm like. Is it just kind of a basic stru structure with some accessibility, or is it a really like inclusive with OT, sensory, like all of that? Basic. This is well? basic. Basic, basic. And I guess that's where I'm concerned that we're missing a bigger picture of all. Well, you can have that. You can have that just. Wait, but <laughs> I think I, and I, okay. Or they could like plan for it, yeah. and you could do that. That's what I've been asking. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like, I mean, they can throw in, you know. You keep adding structures, and you know, more structures. That's why some playgrounds are built through adding new structures every year or two. You know, and many of them have smaller and features <laughs> that you can add in that way within your mm -hmm. typical budget. It's mm -hmm. not a big hit to capital, but okay. you know, I think bare minimum to get anything that would be facilitating gross motor as well as the imaginary play that our regs really are looking for, it's going to take 20 to 25 to just kind of get us in the running. Is that including the fence or is the fence? Yes. Oh, the fence was another 10 after yep. that. Mm -hmm. Can we make sure that um, Ms. Murray and the other pre-K, you know, Instructors are involved oh. in the design. Uh, yeah. yeah. Sure. Can I suggest uh, having a PT involved mm -hmm. also? Yeah. 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 I think I think I would rather have like a dollar amount. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do really well as far as like yeah. bringing those various voices together into several plans. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't want to like yep. get too rigid with that at this point. And I, yeah, I mean that's what helped with the last playground is the board is the board you were really willing to say. So this is the amount we're willing to commit to the project. Go forth, and we actually came back with a little bit more. And you were generous enough to say, "Sure, let's go for that extra more." So it, we need having a target is really helpful, and then getting the right people into that design. Mm -hmm. that so, part of it. so we have twenty thousand come to the um, pre-K rehab. Is that in minimum? That's is that, that for equipment? Yes, that, yes. Yeah. that's, that's a nine. Yeah. That, but it's work. thirty with the fence. <laughs> so, yeah, so remember, so, we. Yeah. I'll, I just want to go back to the minutes that you just approved. That uh, and I'm looking for it in here because I've never got, and I'm looking at my notes from last time that I had here. So I just want to make sure if it's right here in the minutes. Um, nice. We had said your total of ninety, and we had said um, we had said. For my notes here, I had had, um, I had ten for the ten for the ramp. I uh, had ten for the for the fence. We had about twenty for the play, and then I'm going to go back to my calculator to make sure I did this right. This the ground material that you need to have was. Did we agree on the matting ground? Is that what you? That's what I'm talking about. That yes, soft, exactly. yeah, yeah. All, for the entire. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was about ten thousand dollars for the mats, for the, the mats. So it's ten for the fence, ten for the mats. So it's about forty, and, and that's about forty for the ramp, and you know. We, you know, we were saying we've been roughly saying about ninety total for mm -hmm. this whole thing. So that is, does that include the um, rampways in and out of the building? The no, no. But those, the rampway. I mean, what we were talking about for the the classroom door that goes out mm -hmm. is that we built some wood ramps. Those are mm -hmm. that can be done on your maintenance budget. Mm -hmm. But this access. Thank you. Thank you. The front is not the curb. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, the surface whole, thing. the surface whole thing. I think it's possible. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Maggie, you can go first. I'm just looking at the memo I gave you last time. Okay. Go ahead. Um, so I heard, I mean, I, I know that we have a real flooding problem up there, and I'm wondering what um, 
I mean, I would hope that we would take care of that at the same time, and I don't know if the stay met would take care of that, or if so not, then we if need to. If we're going to rebuild the playground up there, we're going to do the site work around it so it's not flooding. Okay. So I, mean, I think that can fit within the estimates that we have for the for the ground material and for the fencing and for all that. I think I don't think that's a big deal. Frankly, I don't see that as a big cost. The bigger cost I see is getting you know for any site work is the ramp mm -hmm. and getting that so it's yeah. permanently drained and doesn't frost. The ramp's not directly to that. I mean, the ramp's going to go across the long part of. The I understand, but remember, it has to be handrails the whole way. Yeah. And we've got to you know we've got to secure those with footings. And we've got to have, uh, in order for a ramp not to, for anything in Vermont not to freeze and thaw, which it will, but I haven't seen anything that hasn't lasted through it, you've got to have drainage down at least three to four feet. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got to go, or we have ledge up there and we've got to be able to drain it so the water doesn't between the ledge and whatever's between that and the, the subsurface and then the ramp itself. Mm -hmm. So go ahead, Maggie, you done? Um, Maggie. Yeah, you done, Maggie? Mm -hmm. Thanks. A good point. Um, jo Joanne and I had noted that a cost-effective solution for the, the ground is that um, Lexi had noted that the grass is, is okay mm -hmm. and so we um, not doing the entire yeah. pre-k playground with the same matter or whatever it is the it's rubber material the rubber, those rubberized material mm -hmm. mats not the, and don't think of the ones and I'm glad Allison you asked this last time it's not the ones that you would see in a gym it's a they have cushion to them. Quite right. But and we want grass and trees and... I, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah, I think everybody does. Okay. Um, and then I also went to um, uh, Oak Ridge Park for All in Burlington this past weekend to just check it out. Um, they just built a, a new um, accessible playground and it's, um, if anybody has a chance to, if you're ever out in Burlington, it's, it's a great spot to go. Um, they just added, um, they had the seven universal principles for design um, hang on their board, and they did have some, some great play structures from um, landscape structures. Um, so they, they do a lot of handicap accessible places, and also uh, Playworks and, and Compen, um, which you know, I know that Amy used Compen before, which are the other playground. But so those are the, the three places that, the three companies that I have researched that have some some good uh, handicap accessible structures. Can you make sure the contacts for those are in the minutes if you don't mind? Sure. Yeah. So it's landscape structures. Okay, so are we at a crossroads? I feel like we are either we're ready to uh -huh. have something. Mm -hmm. Playworks. Mm -hmm. um, it, so Playworks. We want to. And a uh, with a K. I think we want to come in at the center cell. Okay. Um, but we want to just uh, uh, have it so that we commit a song, but have reports back on the different phases. But it sounds like the first phase is going to be design, and this is what we think the design is going to look like, and this is what we think it will cost. Um, so that we at least we're going to start doing the estimating and researching and finding out what the what is really up there. Uh, we're aware of it as it goes along, mm -hmm. as opposed to. Here's ninety thousand dollars, and you don't need to report back until it's done, um, and delegate the authority to sign contracts, which is essentially what we'd be doing because um, Black River is not doing it all in terms of the, the, the building the playground. Um, you, so do we want to? How do we want to handle that? Um, and open to any other options that folks may have mind to discuss. <laughs> So are we on the same page that we want to get a ramp up to the upper playground and put a pre-K area in uh, the upper playground? Including a fence and stay mat. And I think the thing that wasn't didn't have a dollar value attached, but I think we need to commit funds to, is the access to the building in the front. Which I don't know if we have, if that's how much of a that question mark that funding well? is. Well, Black River can, they can tell mm -hmm. us what we need to do with the front and they'll prepare that. So they can design it. Or yeah. I mean, I think you're in a good... I just don't know because I haven't had the conversation with John about that, about working on design on that. And, and the other thing we should keep in mind is that um, <coughs> there will be a new school board um, deciding these issues as of probably as of July 1. And so that could be something that they need to grapple with. Yeah, and I've informed, that, and I informed the new board chair of this conversation tonight. 
-hmm. that there was an ADA issue with the school that would need to be tackled probably mm -hmm. by the new board. Yeah. I, when he and I were together today, I said, hey, just so you know, this is something that's going to come to your board because mm -hmm. you're going to have to, ADA is an issue that all the schools mm -hmm. need to be. So I would be in favor of, because our back of the envelope calculations have consistently come to this number, saying $70,000 mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, let me, give me one second. For the ramp, oh, sorry. dealing with the footing, dealing with the fencing issue, because that's one company that would do that. And there's a whole separate company that deals with the actual playground structure, and we're looking at, I thought, something on the order of 20000 for that. So we could approve. Is, is that an accurate that Black River would deal with the $70,000 item? Items combined? I want to check with John, but if you were to commit to the concept of that design needs to be done by the appropriate folks, whether John says, I can do up to here, and then you need to get other people. We can tell you who the other people are for the playground piece. It's trying to, you know, first off, as Ursula was saying, we need to get a cost estimate, and I'd like to do it for one location for what it's going to take from what John can design. Because I'm right where Maryland is, and say, hey, let's get as much as we can into that playground for structure and, and play equipment for the kids. You know, so it's kind of knowing knowing that top, and I think this is where you were going, Allison, that you were trying to break it into two different components. I'll go either way with you, but, you know, this is the amount we're willing to spend on this issue. Yeah, it just seems like it's two things. Like, one's all the site work and ramps, yeah. and that's, that's the playground fencing, company doesn't do that. Yeah, and fencing. And then the playground yeah. company does the playground equipment. Yeah, that's right. They do the equipment and the and that's it. matting, as I believe. Mm -hmm. Am I right on that, Amy? Okay, then it'd have to be 30 and 60, because we were calculating something like $10,000 for actual footing around the structures. Matty. You're, you're talking, yeah, Matty. talking about Matty. For Matty. Yeah. Not drainage, but just, no, just the Matty. Matty. Just Matty. So we could say we could authorize $60,000, so come back to us with a design that we approve to get up there, deal with the drainage up at the top, and get a fence in the pre-K area. And then we could authorize, again, a design for up to $30,000 for mats and structures. And then hopefully we would get estimates that come back that we could approve or not approve. Does that feel reasonable? The, would the uh, service, would that be a separate That would be separate. If we, if we want to do it all together, we'd have to add in more money for the front, yes. which maybe we should do it one time. Yeah. yeah. I think we have to know what we're talking about first um, in terms of what it's really going to take to. And I have no idea. I mean, we should know that before we can. Because we can't commit. Well, I mean, I look at that and I can't, I can't think it's a significant project to take, to take up all the. You're talking about taking up all the concrete. Figuring out how to work the drainage, um, which would probably include some piping and drainage, right? And maybe digging into the driveway. I, I just don't know, Chris. I know. Yeah, that's, 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 is, is you it don't any, have stormwater. Yeah, that's yeah, we, yeah. That's why I'm saying we already know where, where the stormwater folks are. We're in phase two of that work right now. But we now. need to commit some funds to design it to get the so, input, right? Yeah. And would that be Black River or would that be Black River? That's, that's Black River. Black okay. River. That's all Black River. So, so, do we want to come up with a size <coughs> number for what that your design can come up with? Or can uh, what do you, do you have any sense in terms of what the cost would be to have this area out here? Meaning that the, the drainage issue, the, the I just unstable. had a stay mat put on my driveway and a culvert put in for $22,000. So I cannot imagine that this is cheap. This has got to be a $50,000 project at, at least. least. And probably more north of that. So, I mean, we could pop a number on there and say something like, come back to us with something that's 60000 or less. I think we should commit money to figuring out what the project is yeah. uh, and get an estimate on for what that is. For the front, I would. For that's the front. front I'm that's what I'm talking about. For the front. I, I, I liked where you were going for the other, so we can get going on that. Yeah. Um, but for the front, I've committed some money towards, like, what's this going to cost mm -hmm. us to get, get, get us a cost estimate of, to repair this and to fix what we have less than a quick fix, you know, mm -hmm. let's do something that's going to stay for 10 mm -hmm. years. There's nothing that stays permanently with, with concrete and asphalt in the state of Iran. And the reason we're doing this in two different phases for this, for the front of the building, is because we have no back of the envelope estimation. For I, don't, I didn't come with you for a back of the envelope, envelope estimation okay. for the front of the building. Mm -hmm. I just don't I mean, ask we that. just need to know what we're doing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, have, we don't have as great as, I mean, Kind of rough John gave us John, John gave us back. a day for the back, or yes. half a day, or whatever that was, right? Yeah, yeah, we, guys here. we just don't know what's out there, right. and so I think knowing certainly commit funds to knowing what there is, uh, what we need. 
community plans to find out what we need to know. Okay. And can I hear again from everybody that you want him exploring one site, not multiple sites? For the playground? For the playground. Yeah. So that would be, we'll, that put that, we'll put that into a motion. Mm -hmm. That would be, be great. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> That's why it hasn't been clear on all these some of these things. Okay. Um, so do we have consensus? Okay. Um, if anyone takes a try at a motion, then then we'll make sure it's inclusive as much as we can be and accessible. Take the motion, Chris. You got it. Um, <laughs> so I would move, um, and, and please, this is just a tentative motion. Okay. okay. Um, <laughs> wording. Yes. It's a draft. Uh, subject to word wording. Okay. I move that we um, uh, commit ninety thousand dollars. Um, toward uh, um, accessibility to the playground to include, no, to accessibility issues to include um, accessibility to the um, playground in its current location, uh, to include a ramp, uh, to include uh, rehabilitation of the pre-K playground so that it, that it is accessible. Um, to include new structures um, for the pre-K playground and new fencing uh, and uh, any drainage that needs to be accomplished um, to ensure greater accessibility to the pre-K playground in its current location. And yeah. <laughs> As he's being access in and out of the building Design. As, as, well, no, construction actually. Um, You're talking about the the small piece. Yeah, I'm talking about the small stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, does that need, does you, do you need, feel that needs to be incorporated? I don't need that in there. I don't need the excessive the building pieces that we talked about last time because that's something we're just going to get done this summer out of the maintenance budget. Okay, okay is that on the, the project list? Uh, it's for where it, the project goes exists. Yeah, right now okay. we still have to, we're still getting that taken care of. Okay. Uh, and um, so, that's my motion. Wait, but doesn't it? I think we omitted the part about designing access for the front of the building. I think there's a separate. Which, is that a separate so motion? That's separate. Okay. Motion. Does the fencing need to be included? We included it. Yeah. Yes. New fencing. Yeah. But that includes the play equipment too. Yeah. I, include yeah, the yeah, play structure. I think it's better. It's actually it's all inclusive and it's up to getting a good, good that design. Did you get that? Can you want me to repeat it back? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that feels pretty good. Uh, motion to commit 90000 toward accessibility issues to include accessibility to the playground and its current location, <laughs> a ramp location of the pre-K playground that is accessible, new structures for the pre-K playground, new fencing, any drainage that needs to be accomplished to ensure greater accessibility to the pre-K playground in its current location. The only thing I would request to modify is just take out the accessibility issues part yeah. and just say to create ex accessibility to for all playground show for all create accessibility and take out I'm sorry what was the exact word? accessibility issues okay. just remove that okay. part of it. so I just as far as discussion does anybody in the audience who have have any feelings about whether or not you all think this would meet the needs of present and possible future students? Does this feel like a reasonable yes. option? <laughs> Sorry, I'm trying to be yes. in this. Do we need to include in that to be, is it assumed that it is then compliant with whatever you also need to get the we would say five that stars? What, what happened? Mm -hmm. what would well, I don't know we can say that because we don't know we'll have all the play equipment. Mm -hmm. right. That's hard to say, okay. and we'd be limiting on that because, A, and Deanna, you're the expert in this, so stop me when I go off in the field. Um, it's hard to know always how things are scored. How it's scored. I guess I was just thinking 
when we are including the fencing and gross okay. motor equipment that That's it good. is assumed that those will then meet the standards. But I can't say that because of how someone comes and judges right. and scores us. I would say it would uh, be help. in compliance of licensing regulations. Okay, so to do maybe that. Yes. Yes. The, the stars versus licensing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, just that we're in compliance, okay. yeah. The different tiers of yeah. what we're going for <laughs> here. <laughs> I seconded it before it was reread, but I'll <laughs> second the motion in its division. Um, do we need a um, part of it um, to select Black River? No, because um, actually the awarding of contracts to an architect does not require an RFP, and I don't need your motion to say that. So mm -hmm. I think we use Black River for all the work around the SU except for one building that has experience with a different architect. Okay. And you, this this facility has a track record with Black River, so I wouldn't want to switch it. Because mm -hmm. we're not going to restart plans and elevations and all that. Okay. Okay. But then in terms of the playground structures, when that comes up, that will be a conversation with Probably one of those three that Deanna just Perfect. talked about, or another comparable of that same type. <clears throat> in a conversation with whatever board is or, in place. And probably, and as was said, with experts that are Great. at that at that developmental level. Perfect. And there were many different types of positions that were mentioned in the audience, yeah. and I think they should all be part of it, and probably even some other uh, community members, parents, and. To exactly. come and be just like we did with the last one. I mean, mm -hmm. we did an awesome job of working with the kids, and let's look at different options in design. Okay. And just so I'm clear, this puts aside Chris's other idea of kind of doing an overview on what would be the possibility for other sites. That's right. Just totally. In terms of playground, yeah. it's com it's committing to a direction. Yep. Yeah. And that's I thank you for that. Okay. Yeah. Was it, Amy, clear enough. Yeah. I hope. Okay. Um, any other discussion? I mean, it's second motion on the. We need to vote. We need to vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposed? Good. Um, I'm going to make a, a second motion um, to commit um, $6,500 for um, evaluation uh, and estimate for analyzing the area outside of, of the um, main entrance way to the school and around the side of the school um, to address um, accessibility and drainage and get a sense of what needs to be done out there um, to address the uneven, unevenness of the access to the school. In 65, I took out as 130, 65 divided by 130 is 50 hours. Um, and I know that he would pull in engineers and, and, and yeah, stuff like yeah, that, but. Yeah. And John works well, you should get, I shouldn't talk while you're trying to do your motion. Was that a motion? That might <laughs> 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 Is there a, a second, <laughs> a shorter second? <laughs> yeah, 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 modification? That you say we would. That the motion be you would like to retain an architect to not to exceed sixty five hundred dollars for just for rehabbing the front of the school, access to the front of the school. Okay, that's fine. I'll that. I'll take that from the minute. I'll second that. Okay. Any discussion? Well, I don't want to be nitpicky. No, be nitpicky. Have an hour and a half for each agenda item here. <laughs> Get ready, guys. So, um, the front men. <laughs> You're lifesavers. So, <laughs> so, could we request an estimate on a plan? Because I feel like. I feel like I don't really entirely know what that's. Right, why don't you, that's, that's what you, you're going to get a plan, but why don't you throw in there and a cost know. estimate? Yeah. So I guess, well, I guess what I'm saying is, I feel like we ought to be able to get a cost estimate for what a plan is going to be, rather than. I mean, I I agree yeah. with you. We're picking like 6,500. You know, maybe that's a good right. place to start. That and, and that's why I'm saying to you, maybe you should amend it and include a cost estimate mm -hmm. for fixing. Mm -hmm. A plan, right? 
the cost of a plan. I'm suggesting that we do it in two stages. That we get an estimate for how much a plan's going to be for this, because I actually oh, think, given oh, the groundwater sorry, issues, we actually might have a plan that's quite a bit more expensive than that if we need to deal with if we need to deal with like treating groundwater and where it's flowing. I feel like it could easily exceed that, or maybe it doesn't have to be as much. But if we say $6,500 and it only needs to be 2000 how is anybody going to make it? I don't know. It just feels like we should just ask for an estimate for what a plan, if, if it's a big ticket item, an estimate for what, or am I just being too? Do you think it's too much money? I just have no feel for what a plan is going to cost, and I think, I don't know if they're going to end up having to do, like, you know, digging test pits to see where water is draining, and it feels like maybe if we had a plan, then we would, if we had an estimate of what, what they would need to put into it, then they could make a, the plan that we need, I guess. You want you an estimate for a design? I want an estimate for design because it's gonna, I think there's going to be multiple parts involved with fixing the front of the building. So I think if you, That's kind of what we're looking for. I'm, but I think when, when you, you say not to exceed, I think you're going to get as much as John can give you up there with a cost estimate in it. And if he needs more detail, he'd probably come back to you and say, hey, I need more than what I, I don't think he's going to need more than 6500 I don't even think it's going to take up to 6500 because we have, I, I just know from the construction, we have a lot of detailed elevations about front we don't have it from the back because at one point we were looking at paving that whole circle so so you feel comfortable that john is going to be able to give us if, if that only costs a thousand dollars he's going to charge us a thousand it's all he does that's he, 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 he that john is that's one of the reasons i like work on black River. they're good about saying we hear it's a not to they're not going to read the meds <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. All right. but he, he's just a good guy to work with he's good to say you know, that's what it takes and that's i want to get you there Uh, one thing I'd like to see explicitly considered is the maintainability of it, because with all due um, appreciation to our maintenance staff, like one of the hardest things I think about the accessibility is not just the unevenness of it, but just the freeze on it. You know, they constantly have packed snow that just doesn't it get salted, but it doesn't get cleared off, and whether that means you know concrete heating or you know some some other aspect of dealing with the, the with the packed snow and ice that is constantly there, I think is going to be a big factor for the accessibility. And so I want the maintainability considered in addition to just what the basic cycle is. Is that something that well, I would within? think? Okay. I'm sorry. I would, say I, I would I would imagine I would expect that, um, and that's a very good point, David. Is that that would be insured, you know, as part of creating an open access space? How do we ensure and that's making sure that, that is clear? Right. I would imagine that would be kind of happy part of. The expectation of the building, right, is that we have to have it so it's not packed with ice or snow. I wonder if that's, yeah. I mean, the idea of the heat, you know, I wonder if that's something that can be incorporated into the, the building. Building is like the laying of the concrete itself, kind of like uh, heat pipe, you know, uh, wiring your high pipes um, or radiant Radiant heat. heat. Um, just if it's yeah. if it's possible, thing whether it's it's worth getting a cost on. I mean, maybe we should have David move far so we don't have to do that sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but I thought, I'll just talk to John. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Whether it's even feasible. Yeah. 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 I'm okay with that. We did talk to them. Okay, any other um, comments on the motion? To the process of the It's a process of the Okay, can we? No, no, no. Would you reread the motion just sure. so we're clear on it? Uh, to obtain an architect for $6,500 for evaluation and estimate of analyzing the area outside of the main entranceway to the school and around the side of the school to address accessibility, drainage, and get a sense of what needs to be done to address the unevenness of the access to the school. Okay, so that was the wordy word. <laughs> 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 um, and we uh, let's, can we scrap that motion? That one. Thank you. <laughs> um, I move that we uh, commit up to $6,500 uh, for an estimate and plan for addressing the accessibility in front of the building. Second. Friends, but yes. What? We should probably include, unless that includes the side, we should push up to the side of the building. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's wide. The main pathway to the building? Yeah. Main yeah. access way to the front and side entrances. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The front and front <laughs> entrances? Yeah. Yeah. The main pathway to the building okay. would probably cover it. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm sorry, can you second it? Uh, Mary Lynn. Okay. 
any more discussion? Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? None. Passes. Okay. Um, anyone want to take a break? Mm -hmm. So next up is the Okay, next up is a um, discussion of the dream rehabilitation and talk about for sound issues. Um, last meeting, we um, committed to um, up to $93,000 for that project, as I recall. Uh, uh, pass a resolution. Pass a resolution, yeah, because otherwise you didn't have enough money to do the two projects you said. Okay, so what, what are we looking at in terms of money right now? Well, you just committed up to 90 and you had 116, so now you're down to 26. Okay, and what's in the um, general fund balance? Um, there's about 116,000 right now in the general fund balance, and you'll need to go, you need to do, 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 can I, sorry. Can you give me two seconds? I'm putting, so I can, I'm, putting, I'm putting a note to call John tomorrow morning. So I'm just going to make sure I don't lose this. Do we need to factor in the 6,500 to that figure too, or is yeah. that coming from yep. somewhere else? Yep. So that so was 965. So right now, you have in your your total budget for this year, and this is one of the things we'll be talking about on the 17th, is 3.3. So you have um, your one of the recommendations Lori and I have been working on is it one and a half or is it two percent to cross over and fund balance so that needs to stay in the checking account as you cross years here. We're thinking it's probably going to be two percent. We we're trying to get down to one and a half that we're going to be recommending to all elementary schools on June seventeenth. And two percent is that of the budget? of the overall budget? Okay, and what is that number? The overall budget is three point three million dollars. 66,000 is 2%. You need to leave. You have 116 in there, so I was about to do that difference for you right now. 50. Yeah. Or so. 50. So 50 plus 25. So 75. Yeah. And that's without any contingency for either project. So this was 75? It would be about 75. And, and you know, that can change, but. That's where you are right now. Okay. 75 is what's left over to work with. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. If, okay. if then that, that's, that's like putting that, all the pennies in the jar. Yep. Okay. Now, didn't you also say last that we were looking at five to 10,000 in uh, just soft maintenance costs? Things that weren't going to come out of the capital budget were going to be coming out of the operating budget that we needed to factor in? Yeah, we were taking care of most of those through the operational budget this year. So I, I think I think those are in close out. I'm like 99.9 percent .9 sure, but I didn't ask that question. Today. Those are in close. So we're not. We don't need to factor that in. I think I've already signed. Yeah, I think so we signed for all of those. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. The only thing I haven't signed for is is that the contractor hasn't been selected. Right. But we know what that is, and we think we can do that in this year's budget. Last I heard. All right. Okay. So yes. then, Brian. So the answer is yes, Brian. Does Sorry, that speak to, Brian, you had mentioned stuff in the budget before that little things that maybe needed to be done. Is that what you're speaking about? Uh, 
I think so. Mm -hmm. Last at the last meeting when we were kind of doing this yeah. similar analysis, Bill mentioned that of the 116 that we had left, some of it was going to like five to ten needed was was going to be spent on just little things. Yeah, we're trying to. I mean, our goal, what we're doing this year, and this is a tactic with all the elementary schools. A little, a little bit with you too, too, but not so much. Um, is that any like maintenance, anything that we can pull out of this year's budget? Because we're usually we, we don't mind rolling over with extra cash and fund balance, but we're trying not to do that. So we're trying to, you know, basically spend it now mm -hmm. as okay. much as we can. Okay. We're all we're all to it's committed to the two percent number. Uh, yes. Okay. I mean, I not I can't say that number, Chris. I shouldn't say it yes that way. All boards are committed to rolling as much as they can into their capital funds. No, no, no. I mean rolling over into an operational fund for the new. Uh, I, I can't. I can't um, operationally say anything smaller is responsible. Okay, but I'm asking if all the boards. It's I still a board decision. Right? I, yeah, and I can't. I okay. can't say yes or no to you that on that without having all the boards in one room. Well, have you heard from any that they're not committing to that? No, but I can't. I haven't heard from anyone they would commit to that either. Okay. I'm just going to give it right back to no, Mr. I know, Attorney. I know, I know. Just, it's, it's, don't, don't. So are you, are, are, are we the first <laughs> meeting that you've raised the topic? Or no, or it's, I've been, we've been, we've been having this for a couple of months. I've been you know, saying we're all trying to move it into our capital. Work. No, I know that. And I said to everyone on June 17th, I've been saying this for two months now, on June 7th, it was going to be June 5th, but now we moved it. So it's mm -hmm. June 17th. We'll give you all an estimate at that time exactly what where it's going to be based on what the flow of cash is going in and out, but you just can't cut off the checking book, the checkbook mm -hmm. too early. Mm -hmm. And then that will go into the general fund balance. We also know, we've also come, and I've said this in other meetings, we think U32's fund balance will basically take care of what the new fund balance will be for the merged district. Mm -hmm. You don't need to keep, I mean, at, at all together, and we've given you some reports for many years now that there's a combined fund balance between all six schools of about $2.1 million. With the entity of as large as Washington Central Unified Union School District, we only need a fund balance, we think, of somewhere around six hundred dollars to $750,000. So we can take a lot of those funds and invest it into schools, into mm -hmm. learning needs, whether it's facilities or whatever. And because the, there's a bigger the risk gets spread out over a bigger entity. So you don't need the, the 4% was kind of pulled out of thin air at some point many years ago. There's no golden rule, it's a risk analysis calculation. Mm -hmm. That's why if we were at Doty, I, they don't even use the 4%, they use like what's the biggest cost gonna be and they use $75,000. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, yeah. Uh, could, could I just ask for clarification? Um, at the May meeting, it was my understanding that uh, there was in the funds expected to be available after the merger enough money to make the acoustical renovations in the gym happen, and that was we're talking ninety thousand or so. Um, can somebody explain to me how the sixty six thousand or whatever it is, this two percent? Have that dropped out because I don't understand what what it's. So what's happening for. is with the you can't take all the money out of the general fund on July first and put it into the capital fund. You have to allow some money to be in that general fund to keep the place. You've got to pay bills and there's other pieces that we need. We can't take out. I've, I've been saying to the boards for six months now we can't empty everything out of the general fund and put it. But is that money that will sort of reappear no, later? It'll be in the new entity. It doesn't mean the new entity can't use it and commit it towards something, whether it be capital projects or not. It's just it will be in the new entity. Okay. So is, the, is, right. is that money used to paying ongoing expenses like salaries um, and things like that? Or is it for uh, it's it's non-ongoing? It's a cash flow situation piece. The way Laura's explained it to me. So, but is that for ongoing bills like salaries, um, well, or keeping the lights on, or paying all the above, all the expenses that are <coughs> happening 12 months a year? 
but it's so where is the funding um, presuming if the budget passes yeah um, where does that funding then come into play for paying operational expenses ongoing operational expenses any operational anything that's billed after so here's the thing when the electricity happens yeah you don't get billed on the 30th of the month I and mean, we all right. get electricity bills I don't know what our day of the month is for running it's different for all six buildings sure. So part of that's going to be, let's say it's the 20th of June. The 20th of June bill will be paid out of the Romney budget, and the July 20th bill will be paid out of the new entity budget. OK, so the, this this 2%, $66,000, yeah. um, is that uh, money that if it isn't all used up, will revert? You'll see it as a revenue into the new Washington Central Unified Union School District. It won't come back to Romney. It won't come back to Romney. Okay, is so there a reason for that? Because that's the way the accounting rules are. That's all I can tell you, Chris. Okay. Uh, but we run under GAP and under Handbook 2 yep. for education rules for accounting. I, I just swear I leave it to Lori, and Lori is the expert. It sounded like what I also heard was that while 2% is the like prudent amount to keep in your fund balance, after all six um, boards yeah. commit their 2%, we will actually have quite an excess of money in the new district's fund balance. I year. can't, I haven't done that calculation, Katie, so I can't say that. I thought that's what you just said. That no, what I can say is that right now we have a real excess of money mm -hmm. because of all, everyone keeps separate fund balances. And that total, that separate, is about $2.1 million. Mm -hmm. Of general funds. Of general mm -hmm. funds. We know we need about 600, our estimates right now are between 600,000 and, 600, and 750, it's $150,000 swing. Lori, and I think I'm siding with her, is a lot more comfortable around the 750 area um, to keep on for all in the new entity. But if we only funded 1.5% in our fund balance, that's a difference of $15,000. Right, right. Which it seems like the fund balance among all the schools going into a potential merger is in excess of the 700. So most, most, yes it is, but most of that, the majority of that fund balance sits at U32. So at U32, of that 2.1 million, quite a bit of it's U, almost half of it's U32. Which it should be, it's got yeah, half the students, it's, it's got a, half That's this. a unified, yeah, yeah. So and, unified that, and we thought, I mean, I, can, I want to give credit where credit's due. This is a Stephen Dellinger paid idea, which is a great one, I think. That it's own, already owned by all five towns, why not use right. that? Yeah, fun yeah. balance, I thought. And then, you know, the new board could say, hey, we didn't use that revenue of the, six, the extra 66 for Romney and whatever it is for the other four, put that into the capital fund. I, I could see the board doing that. But I just don't want to speak for that. That's a decision the Unified Union Board will have to make. Mm -hmm. And I think they could, because you're going to see any fund balance that comes in as an excess revenue. Okay. On top of that's the way it works this first year. And then there will be fund balances every other year after that. Okay, so, um, in terms of the gym rehab issue, uh, I would like to um, make a motion that we commit as much as possible. Um, toward that project. Uh, when we reconvene on the 17th, when we have a better idea um, as to what we'll have available to, our, to us, um, but that we take that up again on the 17th of uh, June. That would be my recommendation. A second? Is it just a proposal? I, I don't know if we need to be in motion, but a sense, oh, of, a sense of the board? I disagree. But I mean, I disagreed with the original proposal. I love the. I mean, if, if we had limitless funds, I would love to have completely redo our gym. But that money comes from somewhere. I mean, it's like saying, "Oh, we're getting a grant to do this, so you can kind of spend it willy nilly." Like <laughs> even that offends me. Like it, it comes from somewhere. It is somebody's money. We have windows that need to be done. We have. I feel like we have so many things in the school we need, and to me, that is just not. Like I feel like we have to address the priorities, and to me, that is not a priority. Is to be able to have. Believe me, I would love to, Elliot, and the proposal that you brought is amazing. But I don't, when we are cutting money here and there, I just do not see how we can possibly try to spend $90,000 to make a space that 
you know, for the community to enjoy as a music and get together space that feels irresponsible to me. Not that I don't think it's a good plan, I do, but I feel like we have other things that are more important. There are other fires that need to be put out before we can go make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So um, I think what that overlooks is the impact that it has on students. I during, agree. During the, during the day, so it's yeah. not only a community um, meeting issue, it, it's also a student uh, quality issue. But is it part of the job of the school to teach students how to be able to deal with their sensory issues? Because that's going to be part of life everywhere. Well, so we can we can help students yeah. deal with these issues. We can cut, find ways to... I think, I think we could. And we can also, I think it's about creating a more inclusive environment that's comfortable for students. And that that room is gym, cafeteria, and auditorium. So it is a very multifunctional space that serves a lot of needs for students day and night. Um, so I think that yeah, I think that it has a big impact. I think that's true of a lot of gyms at a lot of yeah. schools. So for, for me, I do kind of, I, I understand and agree about the sensory issues, but I feel like it's it's more of a, a want than a need. Like I do feel like there are things that need to be properly addressed. I think we also have to think about um, a couple things. One is where students spend the bulk of their day, and if we're thinking about sensory issues, um, are the places that they're spending the bulk of their day uh, addressing those in the most effective manner um, that's appropriate, uh, which I would imagine is the classroom. Uh, but the other issue that I don't think we haven't, haven't talked about with this is that um, we are going to be s basically have depleted all of our capital funds at this rate, especially with only putting in 40000 is that the new board, that you guys are going to be faced with the situation of having to start to rapidly ramp up the capital fund in these buildings in order to pay for the need and things that need to happen. And so in order to do pay for those costs, what's the alternative? It's cutting, potentially cutting staff. So I think that's, I think that's the, the longer thing to take into consideration. Even our tech budget hasn't been, like we have an ongoing tech budget that we haven't been able to, with our reduced capital fund, there was no way to pay for that, I don't think. No, no we, tech, we, tech budget's we, all set. It's set, okay. Yeah, it has a constant number every year. And it's staying. So we'll revisit. Yeah, we can revisit this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so can I just ask the, the I board had something to say, right? On the 17th. We are, but not here. U32. At U32. Okay. And ask the board. Yes. Okay. And yeah. then you'll have better financial information. We will. Okay. So okay. did you say something? I did want to say something I'm sorry, about the sensory and those issues. I, you made a really good point about they don't spend all the day in the gym, but <coughs> sensory issues bleed over outside of the one spot where it happens. Mm -hmm. It bleeds into the rest of their day, into their classroom, into <coughs> interactions with friends in the hall, into their day, and it's an everyday thing. And I'm not fighting, because I get where you are with the money, and it's a big amount of money. It's more than what you have left. I'm not saying one way or the other, but you have to look at the sensory issues, too, that it's a big issue for kids who are, and these are young kids. So when they're dealing with sensory issues, yes, we can teach them, but it takes time. It takes a lot of time, and it, it takes more capacity than they sometimes have. Mm -hmm. So then they bring behaviors back to the classroom. They disrupt everybody in that classroom. You know, we, we did uh, begin setting up a sensory room to um, begin to address some of the ways to support students. And, you know, I feel like that project has not been completed um, or is it done sufficiently. And I know that we lack sensory um, OT issues in this in the school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, sh she was more than willing to bring her equipment, ex et cetera, but it's still a shared space. So, I mean, mm -hmm. if the board is interested in doing something of that nature, there are many ways to address that student need that allows for that. I think there's a need. I'm not saying there needs to be issues, but I wanted to say that there's a need. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so are we tabling this then? I would, let's do the Paris. Shall we do the Paris system now? The Paris, the Paris training issue? 
Um, if you want to yeah. yeah. read Kelly's thing. Let me read Kelly's and then I'll probably add some to it. Uh, sure, that would be great. Thank you. Here's that. Here's this for people that need it. I know some people have electronic things. I don't know. Um, so Kelly, shall we from Maryland? You want, yes. Chris, do you want to take a break for Maryland? Yeah, let's take a break for this. That's a huge Thank you. Was there any other questions? Was that was just exactly what she said? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Do you have any, I think so many people actually don't come out to greet me with one because they think I'm EPS. Yes. It happens all the time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're back. Back in. Everybody, go back in. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, second, so you want to so start off with reading from I Kelly? I can do that, Kelly, or, or maybe I'd, can I add a little context and I'll have to sure. read hers. So I just wanted to kind of rewind on this a little bit. Um, about two years ago on labor management, the ESP Association, which Rumney's not part of, or Doty is not part of, but the other four, we started talk, bringing up an issue that we were contracting out more and more for contracted workers to come into Washington Central and work in, in positions to aid students. Um, our two main contractors for that are Green Mountain Behavior Associates or Washington County Mental Health, who you've seen probably on the board order. Um, we started having conversations that it would be better to have, and we were having issues, which this school's experienced as well, is that sometimes we don't have hiring rights over the contractor on who they bring in. They can bring in whoever they like. Mm -hmm. We've had issues at this building and others where that hasn't worked out, and that's not been good for kids. Mm -hmm. So we came to an agreement and finalized it at negotiations this spring. And two years ago, we did an MOU because we were in between contracts that we could hire our own behavioral interventionists and personal care attendants. That came into the latest negotiations for ESP for um, the other four schools. And we agreed upon that we would do that, and we agreed upon job descriptions um, that how job descriptions and how training would occur. We also agreed that, and this is something that was done in the MOU and we stayed with, is that they would be paid at a rate because they need other qualifications above what a paraeducator needs to have, that it would be a 10% increase to the current pay scale. Um, and the big agreement we came to was that we had this big idea that isn't it better to have our own staff who are trained and can stay with kids for multiple years, but that's the other thing with contractors, usually they don't stay for more than a year, they bop around and go to another. That it'd be better to have our own staff trained and that we can keep them for the longevity with the students. And that it would be better for the association because they would have, we have a recognition clause, for any of those who are uni used to association union agreements, there's a recognition clause of the job positions they cover and that they want membership. Who is that with recognition clause mean? The recognition clause means that we recognize that um, the, for this case, it'd be the lot, it's not in Romney, but for the Romney teachers, that the Washington Central Teachers Association represents them, and that um, they, that folks that are in the association and now because um, have rights to be part of that, uh, people that are teachers are those types of jobs have the right to be part of the association. Uh, when the Supreme Court struck down the Fair Share Act in all states, about it's been about eight months now, I think. All right, it's somewhere eight to ten months. I see Dave shaking his head. So um, that it's that we can't comp the association can't compel everyone to be part of the union. So they have a right to access it, and that the the and that the contract that's there that's agreed upon represents the contract for all folks in those job class those job. Uh, categories that are covered. So that's really kind of like it's it's the that general contract covers all those job all those job classifications. Um, so one of the things that I did my first year here, um, and it, it had been happening under Robert Brooks before I was here, but by the end of my first year it had been done. Is we made sure that folks had equal experience, not years serving, but equal experience. 
we're being paid the same rates at Doty and Romney as what we're having in the union agreement. Mm -hmm. And we re-audited that again this spring because as we knew we were moving to one entity, we really wanted to ensure that. I also ch checked with Scott Cameron, our attorney, to say, Scott, what happens with Romney and Doty? They, they're not represented. Do they automatically come into the union? Do they automatically not? Um, he actually advised me to have a conversation with Vermont NEA, which I did not. Uh, but he did some looking for us, and he believes that it, and, um, that the site has to vote to be, come into the union, not for the then individual. If they vote to become part of the union, individual members can choose to become or not. And the analogy for this that I think works better, it's at a larger scale. If you think of the United Auto Workers, they have a contract with Ford. Now Ford has several plants. Not every plant has to be part of the union until that site votes that they want to be part of the union. And then I'm using the exact same analogy Scott used with me, and I thought it was brilliant. And then once that plant is, then workers in that plant can cho choose to join. So it's, it's physically site-specific. So if Romney joined, decided to join the union, they could, and Doty could stay out. If Doty chose, they could to go in, and Romney didn't want. But it's a, it's a vote of the folks that are in those job classifications at that site and then individuals can choose. So one of the things that Rummy did years ago as a board, which was great, you decided to give all the same benefits to your non-licensed um, non staff. I want to make sure I say it that way. All your non-licensed staff as what was happening across the district for those that were in the association, except for one regard that was different. You had them, allowed them to have access to municipal retirement, the state's municipal retirement. We've never had that in anywhere but central office. The rest of the ESP only had access to a 403B retirement system. So in this new negotiated agreement, we also agreed to add municipal retirement so that folks that are out in the ESP and the other have access to municipal retirement as well. You may say, what's this have to do with training the staff? It's just so you understand, we have to get everything to one because the labor law, and Chris, you probably know this 10 times better than I do. No, we don't. Uh, labor law. Oh, you're not a labor law? I thought you would with all your... Yeah. Workers' Conflict is something that I would tell yeah. you, yes, but okay. labor law, I would say, you know. So what Scott said to me is, you cannot provide unequal compensation for people working the same job within one organization. I mean, that just makes sense, right? So if we have a paraeducator here at Romney, a paraeducator at U32 with the same job classification, with the same number of years of experience, they need to be paid equally and they may have to have access to the same benefits. So, and I would say that depends on the contract, actually, because well, they just, well, the NPR just had a, they, I, where they, they negotiated two tier for yeah. newer employees and older employees doing the same work yeah. um, and trying to get away from that because it was irksome. Yeah. But anyway, that's the advice Scott gave me. He yeah. said, you want, you want to make sure you're doing everything the same. So the nice thing is we have all of our, uh, from Carla did the analysis, oh, it was probably oh, uh, a month ago, or finished the analysis a month, six weeks ago, saying, hey, everyone in Romney, and Doe, there were a couple people had to adjust, but it, was, it wasn't anybody at Romney. Um, but we've got everyone paid where they should be based on their experiences and based on the salary scale. So we said, okay, and then, what happened was, Kelly, we've been working on this project to get VIs and PCAs as a job class into the negotiated agreement on the idea of let's get more people in and so we're not working on contractors. It's going to save us some money and we'll have people that are our own employees, which will be much better and much better for students. So Kelly put out, from the negotiation of that contract, we said, hey, we're not going to tell everyone they have to take it. It's a choice whether they would like to take the training. And if they take the training, does that mean they're a BI or a PCA? No, it means that they have access to do that. And if you have that training, so choose to take the job. And do you want to tell me if I go anywhere or out that I didn't either explain today or it I exactly forgot. Like what you told us. Yeah, I'm trying to stay right to that same piece. Is that you can take that training, and then if you choose to take a job that has a BI or a PCA, you'll get that 10%. You don't get that 10% extra just because you have the training. You've got to have do that you type take of work. The job. you got to take the work. The other question, there are a couple other questions, and Joanne, I'm going to ask you to 
help me with what I forget from your questions because I thought they were great. They were right on point. Um, but was if I become a PCA and a BI, does that mean I get moved around? I mean, that's the big question. Do I get to get moved? Do I get moved around? And the answer is, I can't tell you for tomorrow. I can't tell you for two years from now because student need changes. We want to have people. We know that long-term longevity with students, with um, coworkers, is better for school systems and better for kids. So we want to keep that. What we want to be able to do is say to our employees, if we have to riff you from the school, we'd rather have you have able, the ability to go and have a job somewhere else without saying to you, you have no job. Um, and so having that training, will that help you? Yeah, that gives you more qualifications. Um, you know, I, the, the contract with the ESP is a two weeks notice when, when student need changes. If a student decides to move out, and it's a two week notice. We haven't always done that. Sometimes we've kept people on for the rest of the year. Um, we usually every summer. And I know today Kelly was working with a special educator, so I didn't, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to talk to her because that was after you and I met with her and the rest of the paraeducators. Sorry, you shouldn't be just saying Joanna was the whole group. No, no. Um, and we said, hey, let's, um, you know, they're, gonna, they're looking at the student needs as we do every year. About, and we look at it in October, trying to forecast it from a year. We do it again. <coughs> we say, where are people getting placed for jobs for next year within the building? Um, I, I don't know the result of that. But, um, so that, that's what this training is about, for supporting people to do that. If they're, they've, if they're handed a contract to do PARA and they decide they might want to do it, they can, or they can stay in a PARA after their training. So that's the that's the how the training got to be where it is. We're in that implementation. It's bumpy. I'm I'm not going to say it isn't. We'd like to have everything figured out. We're trying to build this and fly it at the same time. And right now we have about uh, 10 to 12 outside contracted positions coming in for BIs and behavior supports across CSU. We have mm -hmm. some in this building. Um, you know, and so that's what we're. We've put together our first training pretty quickly so people could access it. One of it was because U32, they have an extra day because they had to, as you know, Chris, because you were at the executive committee, U32 had to cut a student day just to try to get everything to end. Mm -hmm. So there was a way of like, hey, let the two days that pairs are contracted, they could take this training. It's not the only time. It's the first time we're going to do the training. We really foresee that we're going to do it in August again. And we're probably going to have to do it a couple times a year and keep it going. It's going to be a, one of those things that just happens for folks that want to do it. And so, so um, what is it that, what is the implementation of? The implementation the, is of, of having the training for those who would like to do it, because if we can't get enough BIs and PCAs out of folks that are here that want to do that work, we're going to have to go out and continue our contract with the outside, which it, it's it's moderately successful at best. It's not great. Do you, just um, what are the um, different qualifications um, that uh, between what a, a parent has now? Because you said there's different some additional qualifications. So I can't tell you everything because some of those I can tell you some of them, but sure. then it's going to get down to IEP specific because the IEP determines sometimes what the training is that the person needs to have. Okay. You need to have a greater for a behavior <coughs> intervention, so you have to have you have to be trained in de-escalation skills. Right. So that's verbal. Uh, and then you get trained in handle with care, which is a restraint behavior. Mm -hmm. And you get trained, you have some decision making protocols that there isn't a name for, or there's one I don't remember. Uh, Amy didn't help me here with anything I might forget, but there, there are some of those that it's usually looking for someone with a bachelor's degree. Not necessarily, but that's usually the level a person. That's what Washington County Mental Health requires is someone with a bachelor's degree to work for them. As a BI, and for the personal care attendant, um, it's a lot more specialized because it's care, personal care uh, for a child, that, which could be anything uh, from feeding to bathroom supports. Um, is it uh, so? Is currently now um, in in our schools, um, who are the individuals responsible for potential restraint if it comes to that? Um, it's either the behavioral interventionist, your behavior support person here, 
the principal. Uh, I used to be trained, but I lost my training a, a year ago. Mm -hmm. I've done it in these schools. Or it's contracted for. Or it's contracted for. Or it's contracted. And really contracted for now? No, uh, the BIs are. And that's, what, that's what we're trying to bring in house. Okay. Um, is, is there any. Um, if the parent just didn't want to go through the training, um, that parent's job would not be in jeopardy, would it? I can't say that, Chris. That's what people want me to say. And I can't say that because the student need may change. Well, that wouldn't be. Um, so if, if the parent is already has a contract now. Um, they all do. And it, what? They all they do. do. Um, are those other <laughs> contracts, are all of them tied to particular student or some of them tied to a particular student? All of them are uh, tied to IEPs. IEPs, okay. So the services, if the services change in the IEPs, then, because you can, you can still have those same kids, but the services can change. That's why I'm being, I'm trying to be pretty precise here. Mm -hmm. If an IEP team increases or decreases services, that can change what the student need is. So, um, there was a situation that we talked about not too long ago where you know there might be a need to change and this could be a way for um, the, the to maintain continuity of yeah well, they, service is yeah that, can i just give a little bit more for folks that may not yeah I'm try, yeah, yeah i know what you're trying to do but i think i can help you with this okay, great. there was a need to change and this happens for some kids sometimes they change from being with a para to a behavior interventionist I'm not tying it to any mm -hmm. kid. And so um, that does happen. That's happened before with kids. And that may be a way to keep continuity or at least keep the staff in the building if there's someone that's training on behavior intervention skills. It may be. I don't want to say that it is because we've got to get down to the individual case. But What's is the, that where you were going, Frank? Yeah, that was, yeah. What's the Medicare reimbursement on a BI that's a para, or a BI that is within the school district? Uh, I don't have that rate off the top of my head. Am I wrong when I'm remembering that? No, you're right that there's money There's money for reimbursements for... The for, Washington County Mental Health. Yeah. Or for our own that we hire. We can do we can do reimbursement ourselves. We so. can? Yep. Okay. And who pays for the handle of care training? I think it's about $2,000. So you, you guys pay for well, it? We've been paying for it all We have in-house trainers for that. We, don't, we have two people, Michael Sherwin. Uh, I'm glad you said that because that reminded me that Matt Young with him leaving. He's one of our... Mm -hmm. well. so Chris, Malone. Chris Malone is now a trainer. Good, yeah. Kelly was thinking. Yeah, so Chris and oh, and Eric Bennett at U32 is a trainer as well. Um, is, is, it, is what, are there concerns then? Uh, Join just well, everything that Bill said is that on face is absolutely true, and I don't think anybody would contest it. Like, I think the other side of the coin that maybe isn't being addressed is more philosophical and I'm not sure that, that, you know, I don't know if that's where we need to go with this or what it is, but I think one thing that you didn't mention that what, from Kelly's letter, did Yeah, I agree, I didn't yeah, even read Kelly's letter. I think Kelly's you letter. should, if you read Kelly's, Kelly's letter, I think that me, might me provide context. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not certain as to why this is on, paratraining oh. staffing. I'm not certain to, as why this is on the agenda. However, in order to inform your discussion without being present, I thought I should have some pieces of information. Please see the attached FAQ document as it was shared with all the para and education strata staff across the district related to this issue. So you, it's a two-pager. Looks like this. Um, and, and Kelly's had other emails out to staff as well. I just want to say that. Um, Superintendent Kimball, thank you, so formal. Uh, Superintendent Kimball and I met with the pairs from Romney this afternoon. He answered specific questions. This was a plan early last week about this. Um, I also met with the special educators at Romney to begin looking at pair assignments for next year. All pairs have been informed of what their assignments will be given, what we currently know about their student population. As you know, things may change over the summer as we never know which students will remain with us and who might move in. Based on the information we have today, the special educators and I are able to let folks know what their assignments look like. That wasn't the letter. I didn't know that letter. That wasn't the letter I was talking about. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> I was about which, which I had um, to pull it up on my computer. Right. I'm glad to do it. Um, well, I just, it, I think it started with something about best practices, and that's kind of where 
my philosophical differences. Based on best practices, it is assumed that every child should be taught by the most qualified teacher, which on the surface, who could argue with that, right? It sounds perfectly reasonable. Um, but as a para who is, you know, an instructional para for 15 years, where I take exception to that is the assumption is that what, where do you get best practices? If you're going to, any, any organization that's going to come up with best practices, you have to base it on something. So I believe, I'm not sure, you can correct me, I believe that best practices comes from a combination of the Levinson Report and the UVM study, which is where the legislature has also legislated on. And those two studies, if you say, if you look at those two studies and you accept them as, yes, this is the best educational practice, then that's what that says. That's what that report says. That doesn't mean that it is you know, true in any sense of the word. It's just their view on it. And it is not a view that I share. Um, so I, I don't think that that's the only way to deliver quality services. Um, and I also have, for many years, wondered about, we you know, all of us parents have wondered, if the pairs in our building are different from other pairs. And I just have to think that they are, if that's what they think. I mean, we have really highly educated, highly trained, really well uh, supervised pairs. And I would stake my record of teaching the children of my town to read. I would stake, my, I would put my record against anybody's record. I'm a really good reading teacher. <laughs> I'm a really good reading teacher. And so, and I cost a lot less than a classroom teacher. So I don't know that necessarily that that's the, you know, because of best practices, we need to shift our, our, our model. If that's, that's what we're doing, and, and that, you know, I have to accept this because this is what's been told to us. That is what we're doing as a district, but philosophically I don't agree with that. I did want to, I did want to just say that one thing, and this is just my personal take. Um, and I got my contract for next year, it's fine, it, everything's fine. I don't disagree with anything Phil has said, but I just think there's like a, behind the curtain, there's just more to it philosophically and where we're going to go as a district um, after, after this coming school year is the question. So is there any sense that the, this training is something of a Trojan horse that will then um, um, yeah, I think there is. I mean, I, and, and nobody tried to characterize it as anything other than that. Nobody can tell us. They don't know. Of course they don't know. We don't, nobody knows. We never know from year to year who will kids are going to be in here and what needs there are. But if there's also a philosophy that parents shouldn't be doing education work, to me, that does feel a little torch and horses. I don't know. You know, I, I, I don't think anything that they said to us was disingenuous in any way. I think they were very transparent, was very informative. But personally, I still feel that as a district, the direction we're going um, undervalues what I've done for 15 years. And that's, and, a, and that's a very fair statement. Time. We've had that conversation at the, leadership, at the um, labor management, and that's a really fair point to say. I mean, it's um, there's some easy decisions to make. How many of our paraeducators are like certified in Wilson or in Dillingham? Any other certification that you need? I'd have to go at pull. least three. I'd have to go pull from across the issue. We How have many others. teachers are? Again, I don't have that right here. That I feel like would be helpful information to look at at some point. Not now, but um, moving forward in this direction, that would be information that I would be interested in knowing based on what you're saying. <clears throat> Sorry, is someone new to the conversation? Just to clarify, is that um, are these trainings, is that something that we're offering free to yeah. the staff? Yeah, and, and paying them for their days as well. An additional education program? Yeah. And is the concern that this becomes 
more of the position and less instruction. Right. That, the original is, letter is from that. Kelly to us made that part clear. And it started out, I, I just remember the beginning of something like, best practice is stating that this is the way we should go. Mm -hmm. This is going to be kind of a new way for you to have job security, which is a nice, which is great for them to be thinking about it and bringing in house. I mean, all of these things that's actually very respectful in, in many ways. I don't want to. I don't want this to be you know adversarial at all. I really do feel like that being the reality. You're right. We do farm out a lot of these things, and these people turn over like left, right, and center. It would be much better for kids to have people in house that are BIs, and if that's what they want to do. Many of the staff was hired to do instruction. Mm. A couple of the staff were hired to do one-on-one -on -one type of work. We've all done more and more of it over the years as the model has changed. But you know, it just it, what this whole conversation is leading out is the direction. The what is the intentional direction? What do they see three years out, five years out? And I guess I I'm under the impression that fewer and fewer and fewer parents doing anything except those things. That's kind of what it feels like. Joanna, are you referring to what we were forwarded in email? Um, like Kelly gets it sent about, it starts out, uh, you may have heard about by now about the change in contract options. That one? I think so. That doesn't say that. I know the first paragraph says something about best practices. This is one of her. So the first, this uh, starts out with saying, hello all, you may have heard by now Change, about the change in contract options added in the recent negotiated agreement. Going forward, there are two positions in the contract, behavior interventionist and personal care attendant. These positions require a higher level of training and increased job qualifications. They will also be coming with a 10% increase on the pair of pay grade. The hope and intention in WCSU next year is to have a POD and a BI as a support and oversight from the Washington, Mental Health, Washington County Mental Health Board Certified Behavior Analyst and Case Manager at least eight our own BIs, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, <coughs> and it can, goes into the training and whatnot. Is that what you were referring to? I, I, st I think there's still another one. Okay. I, I got that as well. But. Okay. Do you know, is there another letter? That kind of thing? I, I, you know, I, I just don't know. know. I just don't know. Mm -hmm. So is there, um, are there only two positions under this new contract? No. No, these are additional. These are additional. These are new recognized additional positions because they weren't before because we're trying to bring people, to people back on staff. Right. Okay. I mean, it, it's amazing the amount of money we, you know, we hear constantly try to do more with less. Can I think, um, is the um, need for the VI and the PCA? Uh, PCA. Um, increase because of bringing students who were previously not in the, in the supervisory need back in? No. We have increased need coming up. Increased need, okay. Uh, the, what is happening in our society is affecting yeah. our schools. Yeah. Okay. That's all I can say. Okay. So, Bill, do you know if, because um, I assume that the, since these are tied to IEPs, are these considered one on one? Um, support type of related positions or would these be they're usually one on one okay yeah um and would so is it possible that moving forward that the only students that will qualify for that level of support would be students that have in their IEP a BI if BI or PCA required? I can't say that because I'd be conditioning future IEP team meetings and the team is the only one that can determine supports needed for a child. So I'm you asking. as a board can't even do that because you will condition and think yourself liable for a countersuit from parents. I guess what I'm I, what I'm asking is that are there going to be sort of as a as a policy I can't no there will not be a policy okay. or a procedure or a practice on this. Okay. That would be putting at risk of the educational institution. Okay. We will do what is required that comes out of the IEP team. I have to be that direct and that direct in minutes because it's the the, the, te the folks that have the right to determine what the supports are, not how they're delivered, but what they are is the IEP team. And they are legally, by federal law, given that right. No one else is. And 50% of that team is the parents. 
25. Well, whatever they're there, but you you need to come to agreement because there's a 50. No matter how many people in the room, 50 percent. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's true. I would, I would agree with that. Yeah. Okay. Um, any other comments before we move on? Okay. I appreciate so, Joanne's thoughts, actually. And I just, you know, this Levinson report keeps resurfacing over and over and over. And um, I actually think that the UVM study and the Levinson report have some really nice things to say. But to me, the big disconnect that nobody ever seems to address, or I feel like it's unaddressed, is that we keep talking about these really excellent teachers who are super qualified. And the fact of the matter is, we actually have no, as far as I can tell, like, like you say, some of our paras may be, they may fall into that category, and just because they have the name para in front of educator doesn't mean that they are not also really excellent teachers. So it would be nice if somehow we could sort of bridge that gap between um, thinking that you have to have letters behind your name to be good at your job. So maybe maybe uh, uh, push to incorporate the proficiency model that we have for our students. Um, with our teaching staff. So I would ask you to go to the state, leg to the state yeah. licensure board, mm -hmm. because they're the only ones that have control of that, to change our licensing requirements in the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. well, because I, I am bound by your superintendent, and your next superintendent will be as well as every licensed educator, mm -hmm. that we have to meet licensing requirements to be able to qualify for certain job requirements. It's, it, it's not one that I'm saying I'm behind, I'm just saying those are the rules of the game right now. So if you're going to the point of saying that we can't call Paris teachers. I can't. Okay. okay. Well, I'm not saying you can't. Yeah. Um, but what I'm saying is that if we're talking about proficiency-based education for our students, um, the same type of analysis should probably apply to our staff because sometimes right. people with a lot of letters behind their names are not as good and proficient as others. And so going to the skill as opposed to the I would agree. Degree. But just realize I would love to have that system, Chris. Yeah. I can't implement that under the current regulation in the state. Well, but, well, Chris, Chris I, I just, just hear me again. There's no, the, I as a superintendent sign off every year that I ensure that everybody in a teacher position is properly licensed and endorsed. If the state comes back, I get findings on my license for that. I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you qualify a parent as saying that they're a teacher. Um, but if they are able to deliver the same, same or better services as a teacher, um, having them deliver a para, even maintaining the title as a para, delivering the service is what I'm talking about. Okay. Not saying that, oh, all of a sudden paras are teachers, because I, I, I didn't, and th but there can be philosophical differences saying, you know, yeah. a para will never so, be as good as a teacher. No, that's not what I'm saying, but I'm saying I feel like you're asking me to bend the law, which I'm, I do. I do, Chris. I'm sorry. But that's oh, I don't think I'm doing that actually. Because if they're if they're instructional powers now, well, well there's not. That's not a thing. I made that up. <laughs> <laughs> they all say paraeducator right now. There are people doing all kinds of jobs, um, but I've often thought that there should be. There's like this BI and the PCA that there should be instructional para, but. That seems to be going by the wayside because of the Levinson report and the UBN study. But anyway, um, where it could make a difference, Chris, if you're looking, I feel like you're looking for a way to like, let's make this, let's codify this in some way, let's make it better. It all comes down to the IEPs. Right now, many IEPs say the student will see a special educator, X number of half hours, da -da 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 -da, and a week, and a, another service with a paraeducator X number of times. That is where the rubber meets the road. If it says a special educator, it has to be. If it says a para, it could be the para educator or a special educator. You can go up, but you can't go down. So what, what would have to happen is there would have to be a commitment to saying, how do, what do we see as the best delivery model? Hold on, hold on, hold on there. You, you can't say that you're going to condition the IEP team. I'm saying the IEP team, has, but the IEP team has been influenced to stop doing that is been, I believe. I are believe you saying that, the IEP team has been I'm gonna use the word directed, but it's probably wrong. Um I don't know. to it's stop not, I the same Paris. I know I I think I don't know that, but I but I don't know how much if, if for all these years it has said some services are by Paris and some services are by um 
special educators, I don't know how they could suddenly disappear unless they don't write them in anymore. I, you know, like, what, where are all those instructional things going? When you say there's going to be a new, I mean, Kelly said today, there's going to be a new delivery model that, that she, maybe, maybe what they mean is it, it might say parent or special educator and they're making a choice to trade up and say those services are no longer going to be done by para. As you, oh, it says it could be done by para. They're going to be done by the special educator because we believe that's the better model. And they could ter- certainly do that legally and not change anything. I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt that that's what they're saying they're, that they want to do. That might be, that's a delivery model. They might totally be doing that. I'm not saying anybody's doing anything from nefarious. Um, I don't, and I'm not part of the team, so I don't know. But that's the place where paras, you know, if you have instructional, qualified instructional paras, that would be the place. And if the, philosophically we believe in that as a district, then an IEP team could be empowered to do that and they could continue to do that. And They are empowered. They are. They are empowered to do that because that's... But then, that's then, why, are they, why, then why are all the instructional positions suddenly disappearing, I guess is my question. They're empowered to do that when they're in best, where those decisions get made. But why, then why, so that's my question, why, then why does it seem that so, that so many formerly instructional pair of slots are no longer there? Mm-hmm. Is, it, is, it, is it just that kids that happen to come through don't have them anymore? I mean, I know a lot of tier two regions. Well, I, and Bill, I, I certainly hear your concern about the conditioning the team and, and not what kind of rules is like. Right. I have to say this more, they, can, they can't say that either. Right. Like individually or collectively. Um, <laughs> and I'm wondering kind of what the actual like guidelines and definitions are around that in so, part because this like con- conditioning for credentialism is of course something that kind of spans society right, right now right does. speaking of these letters behind your name there's this kind of expectation that if you have you know in the technology industry if you have a certain set of letters after your name um, that it means a particular thing and I wonder if rather than having kind of been explicit to them, not not directing them in any direction. It's just kind of a natural tendency to believe that that the letters mean, you know, this is a qualification, just like a job listing that says, you know, bachelor's degree required when a lot of times these jobs don't actually require a bachelor's degree. It's just like shorthand for weeding out people, right? And and whether there's something can be explicit that doesn't say you should hire you know, instructional carers, just be aware of the fact that you when they're available to you, that is still an option, right? Like, which all the principals know that those are part of there when they sit in LEAs. I mean, those are pieces that they can, they can, it's part of the LEA, it's part of the decision that happens at an IEP team meeting. I, I can't go anywhere else in a public, dis- I can't go in a, I, I will condition the meeting, whether it's private, public, whatever, I can condition the meeting. So all I have to say is the IEP team is the one who makes this decision. Mm-hmm. Because I will be putting, as the head of the organization, I'll be putting us at risk if I say much else. Chris, just in the interest of time, can we yeah. put a time limit on this discussion? No, I think we're, we're set. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, okay. Um, thank you, Karen. Uh, so, uh, next up is. Amy Tom. How would you like us to um, recognize you uh, and the time that you spent here? In terms of, uh, you know, do, you, do you have anything in mind, like like a community breakfast, staff breakfast, um, having in the afternoon, or should we just devise something? Exotic dancer. <laughs> <laughs> What'd you say? I'll go out for drinks. <laughs> What'd you say? I think something is already being organized. Is it? I believe. Um, I think Tammy Johnson is setting something up. So, oh, great. Um, I would suggest that you talk with her. Well, then we fully support that, and, and we have the, the sense of the board to contribute to that. Or adding to it. And whatever we can on adding to it. Adding to it. Okay. Not much is necessary, but thank you. You are welcome. Um, thank you for your help, Amy. Yeah. So, that's. that's um, Amy, thank you very publicly for you came into a very difficult um, school and communal environment, uh, and I think the new school community is um, in a much better place uh, 
having had your influence. And so thank you very much. Thank you. Um, next up, we have um, is Casey. Do we want to have a, a community meeting, meet and greet for Casey? Yeah. Sometime next week mm -hmm. or the week after? Early the week after? So I think it's coming. So he's still July 1. There's some days that Amy and he have crossed for, or crossing for here. And then he'll be here from July 1st on as the principal. Okay, do we want to do it to coincide with when he starts? Why would you do it with the next school year? Next Nobody school year? I, I would suggest, okay. you know, let, I okay. remember Amy doing an ice cream social yeah. right. in Just August. I think that would be great. the best. You'll get parent, more parents mm -hmm. to be here. And all it was that. really fun. Okay. And we did it last year. I mean, you've kept the tradition going. Um, so I, I would just give you a point of uh, that Amy's been really great at working with Casey already and setting up some times to come and see the staff and in service and pieces like that. So thank you very much for doing that. And uh, and uh, I know that Jen and Kelly and I had a conversation this morning about supports from central office since uh, the superintendent transition is happening. That Kelly's going to work with one principal and Jen will work with another. They haven't said which is which yet. But um, are there other mentors? The mentor or support, yeah, I've been in contact with them up. Principals Association to get a mentor going. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And then the transition team on this yeah, agenda sure. was the concept of some members of the current Romney um, staff and faculty community who would be able to be a support team for Casey as he transitions into the position. So it does. This was just mentioned um, indirectly, or I guess directly to me by several um, people who said that it would be great to be able to communicate with um, Casey, like a special educator, a teacher, a uh, um, para slash BI, someone in that support role, someone from the um, Allied Arts program about just set it, helping um, pave a transition into the school. And, offering like that kind of support as opposed to walking into the job on uh, day one with mm -hmm. transition team only being offered by say the central office and all of Amy's supports are like, really insightful but then also the folks who work in the building also being mm -hmm. part of that transition. But I don't have a vision for it. So I would say that suggested. I mean, Amy did this with a team that was here she got really tight with the team. I think Casey coming those three days will nat naturally happen to make that. And I like the idea, so I'm just thinking naturally it'll ebb from some of that mm -hmm. work those three days. It's two or three days? He's scheduled for a half day that's going to be kind of loose meet and greet. Mm -hmm. And then I have a meeting with literally every team in the building Great. on the 12th. Yeah, I think that was, cool. maybe that's the concept that was raised, was an opportunity for um, representation from people who work here to be able to connect early and, you know, and, and be constant. I, I'm, I'm, what if we put out, if there's um, putting out a field for folks who would want to volunteer to serve on that team, but not just for an initial, but over time, as a, you know, just as good, just figure out, I mean, it's yeah. kind of nice that people have been in the building and kind of say, you know, what's the culture, how does it work? Um, not that you have to be bound by the culture, but at least getting a sense of how, how things run and just to have insight from folks in the trenches and I'm not ignoring it, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was it was brought up um, at a staff meeting while we were creating the schedule um, by many many uh, teachers and special educators and allied art teachers um, that it would be really helpful and we kind of collectively talked <coughs> that um, people that would be willing to meet a couple times over the summer um, and a, you know a good handful of us said that we'd be willing to do that uh, maybe two or three times over the summer and then like you had said Chris in a continuing into the school year to to help that transition um, so there were many many staff members interested in that um, to meet over the summer and I I think that's kind of the model you were you were trying to say um, Katie do you think that would come better from the staff figuring that out, or is that? That's 
Yeah, I, I think I think we I think um, people that brought it up to the board members just wanted to know if we had to go through the board to get something like that approved, or if we could collectively do it at a staff meeting and decide who's available in the summer and who would like to be on on a team of, of that kind. I would I also too. like just recommend that maybe consider let him get through the twelfth where he gets a chance to have seen the Help building the in action. Yeah. 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 I think it, I think and it will meet that. with people and then decide what he needs as far sure. as um, I, I I just feel like Casey needs a voice to be Casey and um, and I think it's great that people want to pitch in and all that, but I just want him to have the opportunity to like think about what's going to work in his leadership style. Did you, did you say the 12th? Huh? Did you say that we get through the 12th? Yeah. Yes, or yes. It should, June. I, June. June. He's coming a couple days, days early. Okay. Okay. I mean, yeah. he swapped yeah. some days. Amy uh, Miner and I talked to the superintendent. We both agreed that swapping some days if he's needed back over there. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. and I, I don't think he needs the board okay to reach out to him okay. as a staff. Okay. Um, thank you. Can we do you know, that's coming from the process? Okay. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, so that's. Uh, uh, oh, next up is Winter Wellness Program. Now, do you have an open Kelly on this, Tim? I do, and then Amy's done some work on this. So I can Amy, this well, then let's hear from Amy first. The um, live no, I mean, winter wellness was not under threat, to be clear. Um, we had shuffled some grant money to be able to move social and emotional learning curriculum forward. And as it's a fairly small money commitment and very steeped in tradition, um, I voted for it because I knew we could find the 3500 So I've already made connections with Lori Bebo to make sure that that money is uh, you know, earmarked or within our budget for next year. I've also connected with Casey, as that's his pot of money, and he's in full support of continuing the program also. So, just, yeah. Okay, great. So, and we're certain then that the, um, I think the concern that was raised was that if the money that was dedicated to much wellness got shifted to another source, and I mean, I think from our experience with the budget, the budget was down to the wire on funding, so it was unclear that there was going to be thirty-five hundred dollars to fund this. Yes, and this is the way the budgets go. Okay, we get more and more sure every day; it gets closer. But it's it's certain that there is thirty-five hundred dollars for the wellness. That will not be an issue. So, the answer is yes. Yes. Okay. I can't speak past next year, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can't imagine that yeah, I program imagine. going away. And I mean, honestly, there's that amount of fat that we could find to make it continue. So should I read Kelly's piece into this? Or sure. Not? Uh, winter wellness, I'm not certain why this is on the agenda, but I thought I'd provide some context around the change in funding source for this program. I oversee the EPSDT, which is a health and wellness grant that has funded winter wellness programs across all our schools. While I oversee these funds, there's a group of folks representing all schools in Washington Central, along with someone from the Department of Health. They get together every spring to talk about the purpose of this grant and how to go about spending the money. This usually involves the school nurses, counselors, principals, etc. During the meeting we had this spring, the group of folks that attended agreed to bring the idea of purchasing a social emotional learning program with these funds to the leadership team. Upon doing this, the entire leadership team was in uh, was in support of using this funding source to move forward an SEL program for the entire Washington Central Learning Community. Therefore, there is uh, therefore there is a committee that will be working together throughout next school year. I think I'll re say that for you, um, which is there's an SEL committee that's looking at programs, representative of grade levels and cross buildings, all the way up through high school, through K through. Well, um, winter wellness program may continue, but through the support of the school budgets. The cost of this varies by school, depending on the scope of the activities that each school chooses to participate in. Um, 
And you know that I remember that meeting. So it was just two meetings ago. The principals were. It was quick. I was like, we'll find it. We'll find it in the budget somehow. And keep learning wellness going, but we need a social emotional learning curriculum. So. Okay. So so our understanding is that at least my understanding is that the one to one this program for the upcoming year is committed to. Yeah. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank okay. you. Um, so that is the last well, item on our discussion agenda. Just, just out of curiosity, was it raised as if it was being cut? That's how I, I learned that the funding for winter wellness had been moved to another source and that there was uncertain funding. And so I emailed Amy and she got back to me that today, but I. No, but, I also got back to you. Well, no, but you got back to me today and said, you talked to Lori Bebo and said. Well, it took me some time to get up with Casey. That wasn't any um, <laughs> judgment on timing. It was a, just a statement of, like, that you, you had said that today I learned that there was funding. But prior to that, um, the question was, in my mind, and the question that was raised was, is winter wellness going to happen? Because the funding had been reallocated. And but I spoke to that on Friday. I said that I felt like the funds were there, and then I shored it up to make sure that as we have the transition, that Casey is well aware of the importance of it. So I just want to make sure that that was never the intention, and I just want to publicly say that that was never the intention in the reallocation. And thirty-five hundred dollars, just to clarify, is how much money it costs to do winter wellness as we have it right now. done it. And it has it gotten shorter over the years? Because I feel like there yeah, we has have been some decisions some around that from classroom teachers as it was kind of in some instructional time. We've also run into glitches with just weather cooperating right. with us. Because in the past we've had like six weeks and then we had four weeks, but then because of snow days the kids really only went right. three days. Yeah. Yeah. Does every school in our supervisor union do into wellness? In some form or fashion, yes. Is there a difference in the cost? Yes. So this may continue, could actually, may be a problem based on I would the say equity. this is one of the places where you could say things are not very equitable across the elementary schools, and you're not at one extreme or the other. Okay. As of oh, my right. knowledge. The middle. I would, I, without going to a financial analysis and a program analysis, but from what I know of it sitting here at the table, you're about the middle. They go to Vail every year. <laughs> <laughs> You're on the public we record, Alice. <laughs> <laughs> I did have a good score. Brian is a sugar bush. They can't be civil after. You shouldn't be civil after. Is that? Okay, so um, reports this, to the board. Any education goals? Is that something? You know what? I don't think we have anything on that. Is that right? No? I don't know. No, I don't I just, yeah. Thank you very much. What about the transition? Um, that, was, that we just yeah. talked about that. Oh, it was just listed twice. Yeah. Oh, so that was transition oh. team for Casey. That was not the yeah, transition from transition. running into oh. the WCAST district. Oh. Maybe I misinterpreted well, that. We, you know, it's more of a. How do you want to wind down? Are we meeting on the 17th? We yeah. Let's put that on that. Can we? Yeah, we can. Yeah, Could I get that. bring feedback from Casey or like some sort of statement as far as what he's thinking would work after having talked to people? Sure. Would that be? Oh yeah. Okay. Oh, you mean for transition purposes? Yeah, that'd be yeah. great. That'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Can I say one thing, really quick? Um, totally not on the agenda, but um, the garden, and I just really want to thank Talitha for what she has provided to the garden and then what she accomplished over the course of like the past three weeks, maybe months. So she set up a GoFundMe for many aspects of the garden. And if you look out there in the rain today, you'll see a beautiful new gate. And um, she raised a goal of $600 was her goal and she succeeded that goal. So I just wanna thank her and I hope that someday we continue to have a garden coordinator because I think it's so important and the kids get to benefit from that. So I reckon I just want to say it's really awesome and just shows dedication to our community that we pull that off in like a small amount of time. Yeah. 100% Great. her. Thanks very yeah. much for recognizing to meet that. Um, any reports from the administration? We were, we're shooting for the 17th. So 17th is what we were shooting for. Okay. 
Um, so it looks like uh, so we'll get the financial report. All that. Okay. Okay. Good. Everything. Um, it looks like our agen action agenda is done, unless there's resignations and hires that we're not aware of. Um, so any any other forward business? Any comments mm -hmm. from Amy, Bill, audience members? Thanks for sticking it out. Yeah, that's so guys. Yeah. Yeah. Eight o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we will adjourn <laughs> at. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, so oh, yeah. No, no. Board orders. Oh, we have okay. so we need a motion. Need a motion. I move to approve board orders in the amount of sixty thousand five hundred and ninety seven dollars and eighty cents. Second. All in favor? All right. Aye. We signed. Yeah, we still want more is, is uh, initiated.